To be fair, you have to have a very high IQ to understand Rick and Morty. The humor is extremely subtle, and without a solid grasp of theoretical physics, most of the jokes will go over a typical viewer's head. This coffee pasta has circulated around the internet for years, taking a pot shot at the low-hanging fruit that is the Rick and Morty fanbase. In it, the average Rick and Morty fan is portrayed as a pseudo-intellectual, with delusions of being much more intelligent than they are. The type of person who types out Reddit comments with a thesaurus open in another tab, so they can pretend they know what the big words mean. The origin of this paragraph actually dates back to around early Season 3, where the internet at large was tired of the obnoxiousness of the fandom and turned to ridicule to try and stifle their chokehold on pop culture at a time where people were getting pickle Rick tattoos and throwing tantrums on the floor of a McDonald's. Yet in its earliest incarnation, the post was being made more or less facetiously, the original poster clearly in on the joke that others repeated, sometimes in earnest, sometimes in jest. This sort of interaction best summarizes the overall relationship Rick and Morty has had with both its fans and its detractors. Many of the examples people use to personify the fandom are typically examples of people making fun of the fandom by pretending to be an obnoxious containment breaker. And many of these containment breakers are simply diehard fans performing a bit, an inside joke of sorts. Hey, aren't there some obnoxious members of this fandom? Good thing we're not like them. But any community that gets its laughs by pretending to be fools will soon find itself overrun by fools who mistakenly believe that they're in good company. While many of the jabs at the Rick and Morty fanbase come from within by people in on the joke, there exists a non-zero number of people who genuinely believe that the show has an elaborate deeper meaning, that it requires a thorough knowledge and understanding of existential philosophy and theoretical physics to truly appreciate. So all of this raises the questions. Are people laughing at Rick and Morty, or are they laughing with Rick and Morty? Can people be laughing at you while they're laughing with you? Who all is in on the joke, and who is the joke? Hopefully during this retrospective I'll be able to not just provide answers for these questions and more, but give you enough context that you can also create your own informed opinions. As always, this video will be split up into individual episode retrospectives, which themselves are split into four sections. Recap, Rant, Review, and Wrap Up. Recap is a short retelling of the events of the episode. Rant is a topic related to the show as a whole, if not the episode itself. Review is a general detailing of my opinions on the episode, as well as some context for those opinions. Wrap Up is for anything I couldn't find another place for. One last thing before we begin. Rick and Morty is a show that deals heavily with themes including suicide, self-harm, talking dogs, substance abuse, and sexual assault. While I make strong attempts in this script to sanitize my language for an easier viewing experience, neither I nor the show strays away from discussion on these topics, and as such, listener discretion is advised. The Real Animated Adventures of Doc and Marty, featuring Doc Smith and Marty McDonald, Episode 1, The Genesis. Marty is lamenting that his kite is stuck in a tree, but Doc comforts the boy by proclaiming that he's going to take them both back in time in order to prevent the tree from ever being planted. But the time machine is broken, and the only way to fix it is to suck on Doc's balls. This works, and then they head back to the past, before the tree was ever planted. When a man approaches to plant the tree, Doc once again tells Marty to suck on his balls, as this will prevent the man from planting the seeds. Seeing the lewd act being performed, the man disintegrates into nothingness. Back in the future, Marty is enjoying himself as he flies the kite around with no tree to obstruct his play. But he starts to vanish, and the duo realize that the man who planted the tree must have been a distant relative of Marty's. Fortunately, sucking on Doc's balls again fixes the timeline issues, returning the two to a happy ending. Yes, this is exactly what happens, I am not making anything up. Question. Why? Answer. Good question. In order to properly make a retrospective of Rick and Morty, it's necessary to start as far back in the show's history as possible, and that includes the show's prehistory era. Doc and Marty shares a large number of similarities to the show Rick and Morty, to the point that it feels like more of a pilot than the actual pilot. But more importantly to the discussion, Doc and Marty gives us an idea of the initial tone that the show set out to achieve. It's a stupid comedy that cares more about riffing on pop culture than doing a deeper dive into anything else. 
It is with this idea in mind that we have to consider the evolution of the show into its later years and incarnations. Obviously, this short is meant to allude to the film Back to the Future. The character names are nearly identical. It riffs heavily on typical short story tropes, including the rule of three. First, Marty sucks dog's balls in order to establish trust in the doctor's expertise. The second time, it's to establish trust in the methodology. And the third time, it's to show Marty's growth as an assistant, creating solutions on his own. There are a few inversions of common tropes for comedic effect, notably the way that the duo goes back in time 50 years to meet Marty's great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, or the way that the solution to get a kite from a tree is to stop the tree from ever growing in the first place with no regard for the timeline. And, you know, all the testicle stuff, too. Obviously, what I'm doing right now is a bit. This short does not warrant the level of analysis that I'm giving it on its own, only in the larger context of the development of Rick and Morty that the short about an elderly scientist's genitals require any level of discussion. But the reason that I bring it up at all is to effectively normalize discussion on future trivial matters. Basically, I am aware that this video is very long, and it may seem as though I'm rambling on for too long about things that don't matter, but this video isn't about succinctly making a single point. It's to give as much analysis as possible so that you, the viewer, can make their own conclusions instead of me telling you what to think. It's just an unfortunate coincidence that doing so requires me to talk about balls this much. Pilot Rick pulls Morty out of school to assist him in the retrieval of mega tree seeds from another dimension. But when Morty breaks both of his legs, Rick uses the last of his portal gun's fuel to fix them. This means that Morty has to be used as a mule to transport the seeds back through interdimensional customs. Meanwhile, Beth and Jerry argue over Rick's influence on their son, and the fact that he's been forcing Morty to miss so much school. They're about to put him into a retirement home when Rick and Morty return from their trip following a shootout. Morty recites a few scientific fun facts, convincing his parents that he's learning more from spending time with Rick than he is learning in school and the episode ends with everybody in agreement to maintain the status quo. Of course, this superintelligence was merely a side effect of the megatree seeds dissolving inside of Morty's anus, and the reality is that Morty really isn't learning anything. The characters of Rick and Morty originated in the short from the previous episode, Doc and Marty. That short was originally created as a sort of protest against the cease and desist Royland had received regarding one of his creative works titled House of Cosby's. But as he was improvising lines for the skit, he found himself enamored by the characters he had created and decided to roll with the new idea that formed. Obviously though, the original concept would have to be changed dramatically in order to air on network television, so the more oblique references to Back to the Future were dropped and some of the crude humor was toned down for general audiences. The cast was also expanded to include more of the Smith family, no longer the McDonald's. This included Summer, an older sister to Morty who at the time was meant to serve as a counterpoint to his storylines. Beth, the successful horse surgeon whose familial attachment to Rick keeps him around despite his antics. And Jerry, the unapproving father figure who needs to be convinced of Rick's contributions to the family. These roles get built upon dramatically as the series progresses, and the roles that each family member serves start to lack demand. Other than the pilot, every episode of Rick and Morty has a post credit sequence that expands upon one aspect of the episode, usually going more into a side character or setting. This episode, however, begins with a pre credit sequence that introduces us to the characters of Rick and Morty through what is effectively an anecdote. Rick gets drunk and creates a bomb. Morty convinces him not to drop it, and ultimately has to disarm it himself. Rick is a genius, but often lacks better judgment, and this gets him into trouble that he has to fight or improvise his way out of. Morty, being more down-to-earth, is then usually able to provide some kind of sensibility to Rick's more outlandish ideas, fixing whatever goes wrong. One aspect of Doc and Marty that has been carried over in full is a commitment to subverting typical fiction tropes. Morty gets threatened by a high school bully archetype who gets a very on-the-nose amount of backstory before being frozen and killed. Then, rather than his death being dismissed as a bit, it becomes a recurring background gag throughout the rest of the episode. Additionally, the trope of a character succeeding through street smarts and practical knowledge are also toyed with, as Morty's seeming super intelligence by the end of the episode turns out to be temporary, and he really is being made worse for his time with Rick. Lawnmower Dog Following the previous episode, Rick attempts to get Morty better grades in math so that Morty can spend less time in school and more time with him. 
His plan is to head into the dreams of Morty's math teacher in order to incept the idea, but this plan goes awry when Mr. Goldenfold is an active dreamer, and he resists the attempts. So Rick and Morty head deeper into various dreams of people inside of Goldenfold's dreams, running further and further from death before they ultimately get trapped inside a recurring horror thriller involving a legally distinct character. They cure his nightmares befriending the terror and using his powers as an escape tool to blast their way out. Unfortunately, prior to this plot beginning, Rick gave intelligence to the family dog, and Snuffles used that intelligence to attempt to take over humanity. Rick then sneaks into one more dream in order to convince Snuffles not to enslave humanity, but to leave the planet altogether, not repeating the mistakes. At the end of this episode, Rick spends a while talking about a potential pitch for a planet inhabited by dogs, a dog world, if you will. Justin Roiland was originally pitching this show, Dog World, to networks in 2014, but it was Rick and Morty that ended up getting the green light. This sequence is merely a shout-out to another timeline that could have been. Roiland himself has two dogs, one of which is named Jerry. The name Snowball is a reference to the book Animal Farm, the name of a pig who also wanted to overthrow the tyranny of humans. Rick and Morty traveling through dreams is a much more obvious reference, one that's referenced in the episode writing itself. I point out these references because Rick and Morty is a show about pop culture. It reacts to, responds to, and builds off of many of the cultural ideas propagated through media. To understand Rick and Morty requires an understanding of the culture in which it was created. The world of Rick and Morty is a world of media. That isn't to say that consistency within the episode is flawless. Rick states that if you die in a dream, you die in real life. Then, in the finale of the Inception plot, we see Scary Terry beheading multiple people, all of whom simply wake up. Of course, it's equally likely that this is merely Rick not understanding his own invention all that well. There's an impression given to the audience that Rick Sanchez is just sort of winging it, making things up as he goes along, and his skills as an inventor don't translate well into planning. Many of the later seasons as of writing this episode have been criticized for depictions of incest, as though someone on the writing staff was brazenly inserting his fetish. Though we can see a bit of an early peak here, as well as in the next episode, of the bizarre relationship that this show has to sexuality. Much of pop media is built around subtle innuendo to attract audiences while circumventing obscenity laws, and so a show that parodies so many aspects of pop culture would be poking fun at this concept. I think it's less about a writer inserting his fetishes into the script, and more about thousands of writers over hundreds of years doing the same. Anatomy Park Jerry is trying to have a traditional Christmas in order for his family to connect more deeply with his parents. But when he learns that his mother has a new lover and that the couple has a cuckolding fetish, this wish is turned on its head. While the family is indeed connecting once again, there's some animosity Jerry feels towards his mother's new boyfriend. Meanwhile, Rick is working on an issue with Anatomy Park, a theme park inside of a homeless man named Reuben. He sends Morty inside in order to diagnose and cure Reuben, but he dies before they get the chance. The episode then becomes a race to escape the dead man that results in a corpse explosion in outer space. The absurdity of both situations resigns Jerry to accept his family distracting themselves with mindless electronics. In the initial drafts of Rick and Morty, Jerry was meant to be a much more assertive and stern character, a staunch if not close-minded foil to the parenting style of Rick. The initial inception had a Jerry who resisted the brainwashing of Morty by his grandfather and was much more of the man of the house than the version of Jerry that we got. But Chris Parnell gave a performance of the character much more reminiscent of his role as Cyril Figgis from Archer, and the showrunners ultimately decided to move the character in a direction that better fit what the voice actor brought to the table. This results in the spineless, unintelligent, and weak-willed Jerry that we have in the first season. His role remains unchanged, effectively a look at Morty's future, should Rick have never come into the family's life. But the implications of this role have changed from an anti-science everyman into, well, effectively the same thing, just with the much less favorable perspective. This then means that the inverse concept has to be exaggerated into Rick and his cool science being placed onto that much higher of a pedestal to compensate, though the real ramifications of this idea aren't explored quite so much within the first season. Later season Rick would rarely entertain the idea of working alongside another person, but in this episode he is not only implied to have collaborated with Dr. Xenon Bloom, but also speaks highly of the man Amiibo's work. But perhaps that's just what a passion project can do for a person. He constantly tries to recommend Pirates of the Pancreas to anybody who will listen, and is shown to be genuinely attached to the project and those involved. 
though this passion later translates to helping the crew escape when the project becomes non-viable. In the end, he tries resurrecting the project inside of Ethan, though when others co-opt it as a quote, monument to compromise, he loses that spark once again. This episode is a clear homage to Jurassic Park and the Fantastic Voyage in one. We've already explored the relationship between Rick and Morty in popular science fiction, so seeing a few new concepts to deconstruct is how the show manages to stay fresh and interesting during its early years. In this episode, we see Rick and Morty shine in how it executes these parodies, show the realistic ramifications of higher concepts, not only in the reactions of characters, but in how they grow and adapt to these concepts. The focus on character is how an episode can have two equally interesting plots about an awkward family holiday and an amusement park inside of a human being. M. Night Shamalians. Rick wakes up inside of what he suspects and then later confirms is a simulation designed to steal his formula for concentrated dark matter. He overloads the CPU of the fake reality in order to escape and tries to take a bunch of loot with him, but it's revealed that he was in a simulation within a simulation designed to steal the combination to his safe. While escaping, he and Morty have to create concentrated dark matter to boost their ship, only to then pull back and reveal that he's inside of a simulation, inside of a simulation, inside of a simulation. With the Zygerians finally stealing the formula for concentrated dark matter during the moment Rick let his guard down, he and Jerry, who has been living the best day of his life, despite living in a simulation running at 5% capacity, return to Earth in an escape pod, only for the ship behind them to explode, as the formula for concentrated dark matter Rick gave up was actually a highly reactive combination of cesium and water. After seeing many of the later season episodes, it's interesting to go back and watch Rick's actions during this one. A majority of the episode's second act consists of Rick running away and improvising various means of slowing down his pursuers. He's clever, and his knowledge of how to adapt to bizarre and alien environments lends credibility to that. But what he's not is a fighter. Season 5 of Rick would have revealed some sort of destroy a simulation ship that he keeps stashed inside of a coat pocket, or he would have simply blasted his way out of the entire thing. He's a survivor in the early seasons, but later on effectively becomes a deity compared to the rest of the universe. And while the end of the episode reveals that he was one step ahead of the Nigerians the entire time, the post credit sequence shows that he's still a little bit unsure of even that. I think the best way to describe the creative style of Rick and Morty is that episode plots read like a bunch of guys sitting on a loading dock building off of one another's weird sci-fi concepts. What if you put a simulation inside a simulation, grows into what if that simulation was also inside of a simulation, and from that, what if you were placed inside of a simulation on accident and it was running at 5%. Combine that with just enough scientific knowledge to keep things legitimate, but not so much that it stops being interesting, and you get a typical Rick and Morty episode. What I mean by that last part is that cesium and water really do react violently when mixed together, but the finer details of interstellar travel are typically hand-waved away as a limiting factor. Between M. Night Shyamalan, A Wrinkle in Time, and even Futurama, this episode follows in the season 1 tradition of wearing its inspirations on its sleeve. The characters even lampshade the fact that the episode is going to be a quote, mindfuck, before all of the layers are revealed, a bit of self-revelry on the part of the writers while also giving a wink to the audience. It's not the first and far from the last time that Rick and Morty will ever make a fourth wall break in this way, but moments like this never stand out too much as a result of the show having such a close relationship to the pop cultural sphere in which it was created and is consumed. Me Seeks and Destroy Tired of always being the sidekick on adventures, Morty decides that he's going to be the one to pick where the duo goes next. They travel to a fantasy land to steal treasure from a giant who looks mysteriously like Dan Harmon, but are caught for breaking and entering, as well as manslaughter when the giant trips and smashes his head open. But after being freed on a legal technicality, they head to a tavern to unwind, where Morty is sexually assaulted by Mr. Jellybean. He escapes, and the duo head back into town in order to share some of Rick's gambling winnings with the townsfolk, giving their story a happy ending. At least, after Rick returns to finish off the Predator. Back on Earth, the family uses a Meeseeks box to summon friendly little creatures who will solve simple problems for them, that way Rick doesn't have to micromanage the family while he's gone. But when Jerry tries and fails to get two strokes taken off of his golf game, the Meeseeks start plotting to kill him, as they aren't used to being alive for that long. But he and Beth manage to overcome the threats, rekindling their marriage, for now, 
This is the first episode of Rick and Morty that shows off the potential for darkness that the showrunners can explore. So far, we've seen hundreds of deaths, assault, nudity, and many other taboos, but this is the first time that the subject matter manages to have a disturbing undertone to it, merely because the consequences of Mr. Jellybean's actions are shown in a realistic fashion. Morty is visibly disturbed by his near-rape experience, and the whole subject is taken seriously, unlike just minutes earlier when Rick made a prison rape joke. We see this happen repeatedly throughout the show. Something that happens in the realm of science fiction that's played for laughs will be presented differently than something that's meant to be taken seriously. Normally a show that attempts this sort of flip-flopping would come across as tone-deaf or insensitive, but that's only if the show fails to properly establish its tone and comes across as poorly written as a result. I'll posit that Rick and Morty's initial success largely has to do with the competency with which it handles its tone. If the whole show were just wacky science fiction tropes being made fun of, or if it was just weird-looking alien worlds and improvisational humor, or a pure character study, then it never would have caught on the way that it did. It's the fact that the showrunners know when to hold back on a punchline and when to commit fully to a bit that makes the show as enjoyable to watch as it is. Dale the Giant's wife calling the police and taking Rick and Morty to a realistic interrogation chamber, followed by a courtroom scene, is funnier after Dale himself comes into the kitchen muttering like a fantasy simpleton. The joke is taken about as far as it can be taken before it stops being funny, and then they move on. But speaking of things that run on longer than they should, Morty's adventure continues past the point of the duo being freed from the prison sentence and becomes washed out, something referenced by Rick directly. This combined with the end of the episode where he announces that he has a new catchphrase in Wubbalala Dub Dub shows a knowledge of the fourth wall, specifically when it's okay to lean against it, to lampshade a plot thread, or to look directly at the camera to announce that the episode is ending. Rick Potion number 9 Morty asks Rick to create a love potion so he can drug Jessica, a girl from his school he has a crush on. The potion works, but it mutates with the flu virus and spreads to the entire world, making everybody become obsessed with the boy. Rick tries to counteract the potion with a different serum, but this merely causes the people to mutate into praying mantis monsters who want to mate with and then kill Morty. When Rick's third attempt at creating a potion also fails and turns the whole world into David Cronenberg monsters, he decides to simply find a universe where he succeeded in fixing the problem and happened to die shortly afterwards, so the duo can take the place of the deceased pair. Meanwhile, the rest of the Smith family has to deal with surviving the apocalypse that Rick made, ultimately thriving in the ruins of their world and finding happiness with each other. The ending to this episode drives home an important point. How much better off would the Smith family be without Rick in their lives? They're shown to be as average a family as you can get, at least within the first few episodes, and many of the strifes they have to overcome are usually a direct result of Rick's influence. Even going as far back as things like the strained relationship between Beth and Jerry, we later see that it was Beth's childhood separate from her strange and estranged father that may have caused her to go down such a path that would make her unhappy in the first place. But while the family is shown to be strong and connected at the end of this episode, we can also see that this is in comparison to how they were at the start. The changes each character has undergone in just half a season are already hinting at future developments as everybody grows in response to their plotlines. Can we say that the Smith family of the Cronenberg dimension is happier without Rick, or is it that they're happier for having overcome Rick? Is his presence in the Smith family just an obstacle, and is there a logical point at which disappearing again would make everybody better off? At first, Beth was happy to have her father back in her life, having spent so long without him. Because of his antics in this episode, though, she's begun to turn on him, ironically just after Jerry comes to the scientist's defense, saying that it's unfair to assume that he's the one responsible. Beth and Jerry flip on their opinions of him on this breaking point. Jerry, because he's no longer living in the shadow of Rick and therefore blaming him for all that goes wrong. And Beth, because she's finally able to put her feelings on his disappearance to rest now that she has an improved family that fills the hole Rick left in her heart when he walked out. And of course, this is the first episode that really drives home the nihilist themes of the series. While later seasons ultimately condemn nihilism as a pointless philosophy, an excuse to run from personal responsibility, here we see the concepts first introduced. Morty loses everything he's ever known in a single night, and at the end of the episode has to bury his own corpse in order to simply leave it all behind. And what does he get from the experience? Ultimately, nothing but trauma. Raising Gazorpazorp. -a -zorp. 
While shopping at a space pawn shop, Morty spots an interesting sex bot and convinces Rick to buy it for him, only for the sex bot to turn out to be an actual breeding machine that births an alien baby. Rick tracks down the home planet of the bot to investigate, and Summer is dragged along, citing the fact that Morty is too busy being a new parent. They soon learn that the planet is a matriarchy, where the woman deploys sex bots onto the male populace to control them while they rule an all-female utopia underground. Rick offends the group and is set to be executed, but Summer convinces them to let him go back to Earth. On Earth, Morty is struggling to raise his new son, Morty Jr., who wants nothing more than to destroy the planet. He keeps the rapidly aging alien inside all its life, until it runs away in its adolescence to destroy humanity by itself. But when Rick returns to kill the creature, Morty intervenes and the act is enough to convince Morty Jr. to channel his aggression towards something healthy, like making rambling video essay writing a novel. The writing, direction, and production of Rick and Morty was done by an entirely male staff for the first two seasons. That's why an episode like this gets created. An all-female society is characterized not by feminine traits, but by perceptions of feminine traits. The titular Rick and Morty go on a majority of the adventures while female characters serve as one-dimensional love interest or, at best, plot devices for Rick to say I told you so to in the episode's finale. Beth and Summer are the only remotely developed female characters in the cast in the early seasons, and even then are more so foils for Jerry and Morty than characters in their own right. But that's to be expected of an all-male writing staff. It isn't until season 3 that the show got its first woman-written and produced episode in Vindicators 3. It's not a coincidence that these are the seasons where Beth and Summer not only begin to take on more active roles in the story, but also get much more development, as they can exist outside the shadows of male counterparts. And this has a benefit across the board. We get to see Jerry grow and develop during these seasons, and the Rick's summer dynamic also takes on a unique direction, giving more variety to what kind of stories can be told. Morty doesn't want to screw up Morty Jr. the same way that his parents screwed him up, and as a result, creates a brand new kind of screw-up for his son to become. Jerry gets an I told you so in before rushing to help stop the rampaging Gazorpazorpian, although he doesn't actually accomplish much. At least he's more of a help than Beth, who missed out on the final act of this episode entirely. Accelerating the parenting process also allows the audience to see a more direct cause and effect from Morty's actions to Morty Jr.'s character traits. And as a result, this episode is a microcosm of the effect Beth and Jerry's negligence have left on their children. This dynamic gets explored in much greater detail in the next episode, so I'll continue this section there. Until then, Racing Gazorpazorp is an episode that serves as a sort of character pilot, in the sense that the show has served as more of a deconstruction of sci-fi tropes so far, rather than a study of the characters in those plots. We see a hint of just how well the show can pull off darker plot beats at the end of Rick Potion number 9, so it's a hefty promise that the showrunners are making, though not one that appears to be outside the realm of what they can do. Ricksty Minutes Bored with regular cable television, Rick sets up the family with interdimensional cable, allowing them to see TV shows from every conceivable universe. When they stumble upon a universe where Jerry is a famous actor, Summer, Jerry, and Beth are lured away with the alternative reality goggles that let them explore life from their other selves' eyes. In that universe, Beth and Jerry were never married and are living seemingly better lives as a result. But despite the other universes Jerry starring in all the movies Tom Hanks starred in in Our World, he's still miserable and goes on a bender where he runs to the home of the successful but lonely Beth, and the two confess that not staying together was the biggest mistake of their lives. During all of this, Rick and Morty sit through a series of improvisational skits. The interdimensional cable skits of this episode far overshadowed the rest of the episode's story beats, to the point where we received an interdimensional cable 2, but not a revisiting of Dimension C500A, where the Beth and Jerry storylines take place. In fact, there's about one mostly improv episode per season, in no small part because of the success of this one. But that's not the only reason, as a large amount of Justin Roiland's other work is improvisational in nature. Not only that, but one of Dan Harmon's other shows, Community, also has a similar episode, a clip show featuring several scenes that the audience has never seen. But personal preference of the showrunners aside, I think that this sort of thing only gets retreaded again and again in the future because that's what audiences want. Rick and Morty stood apart from its contemporaries by having a much looser feel than many other shows. Characters stuttered and belched when they spoke, they were rarely eloquent, and dialogue closely matched the canter that an actual human would use in that situation. This improvisational style is what drew audiences in in the first place, so why not revisit the embodiment of that style as often as you can?
Beth and Jerry both obsess with the universe they've discovered, the one where they get to live their fullest lives rather than being shackled down by kids. They've been wondering if things would be better single through their whole marriage, and naturally the couple obsesses over the reality where they stayed independent much in the same way they've been doing for the last 17 years. At the end of this scenario, however, the two realize that even their quote, perfect selves are miserable and long for each other. It's played as a romantic moment, that the two belong together no matter what universe they're in, but another reading of this moment is one in which Beth and Jerry are deeply unhappy, even miserable people, no matter what. All the anger and frustration and misery in their lives is something inherent and not something they can simply blame on each other. This is actually built upon in a later episode. Rick Mirai Jack reveals that the Mortys are made en masse by the Citadel of Ricks by conspiring to get the Bets and Jerrys of the universe together. This, then, means that in the universe we get glimpses of, Rick never intervened and the two wound up together anyway. It's a much more heartwarming reading than the other one I posited, and one has to wonder just how intentional all of that was. Something Ricked This Way Comes Morty asks Rick for help with his science fair project, but ultimately accepts the help from Jerry instead in order to assuage his father's inferiority complex. But while they're working on a model solar system, Jerry is adamant about Pluto being a planet, to the point that he's abducted by Plutonians who laud him as a great hero for declaring that statement. But Morty uncovers that the entire tour is just an excuse for corporate interest to cover up the fact that Pluto is shrinking due to overmining. Jerry eventually realizes that this moment in the spotlight is merely helping to cover up a conspiracy, but more importantly, it's driving a wedge between him and his son. So he admits the truth and is exiled from the planet for doing the right thing. Meanwhile, Summer is working part-time at a cursed item shop run by the actual devil. Rick gets his ego hurt by the man and decides to open up a store across the street that de-curses the items so people don't have to put up with the ironic downsides. Summer convinces Lucifer not to give up on his ambitions, though, and he rebrands the store into a bunch of tech jargon that gets them bought out by Google. And by them, I mean just the devil, as he tricked Summer out of her shares. So Rick and Summer decide to roid up and beat him up. The two plots of this episode are both focused on the egos of two foil characters. Rick feels like he's being looked down upon by Summer's boss, and as a result dedicates the next few days to hating him, ruining the other man's business so he doesn't feel bad about Summer wanting to spend more time with him. Jerry is an opposite to Rick, in the sense that he's more down-to-earth and much less intelligent, but his ego is the same, and he takes offense to Morty going over his head on the Pluto issue. In later seasons, Jerry and Rick are actually shown to have reasonably good chemistry with one another, to the point of getting along, so long as there's nothing to cause them to be at each other's throats. So while Jerry and Rick are total opposites, they still exist on the same spectrum as one another, with more similarities than either one would ever admit. The Plutonian Elite and the Devil are both in on similar rackets, profiteering off of telling people what they want to hear, and we get to see those plans from differing perspectives. The Devil is lying to people, saying that their flaws are simple to work around and that he has an easy way out for their woes. Meanwhile, the Plutonians lie to their citizens, assuring them that nothing is wrong and that the current system the planet runs on is completely sustainable. In this, we can see how these sorts of lies can suck people in feeding into a group's confirmation bias so that people with fragile egos can receive positive attention is far too common a practice in the real world. And we get to see that firsthand in this episode. It's a bit ironic then that this episode ends with Rick and Summer getting buffed so they can physically beat the devil into submission. It's such an unnecessary revenge fantasy, also Rick can end the episode without feeling like he was ever one-upped by the devil, when the lesson that we got from Jerry's story is that spurning confirmation bias and admitting you're in the wrong is the high road. Rick has no interest in helping strangers, unless doing so will one-up somebody else. For him to have wasted so much time only for the guy he was trying to screw over to come out successful in the end is a loss that you'd expect Rick to simply accept and move beyond. Though in reality, this is actually the first hint of a character flaw that will be explored much further in later seasons. Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind Rick is taken to the Citadel of Ricks, a sort of space station filled with various Ricks from different dimensions, in order to account for the deaths of various Ricks through the multiverse. He escapes with Morty, and the two of them track down the real killer, only for Morty to learn that the real reason he gets taken along with Rick on adventures is because Morty's stupidity acts as a cloaking device for Rick's intelligence. 
They argue, which eventually results in Rick getting captured by evil Rick and Morty taken to a room full of other Mortys. But rather than being a passive observer, Morty decides to lead the other Mortys on a rampage to destroy evil Rick, freeing his Rick and clearing his name in the process. Meanwhile, Jerry befriends one, Doofus Rick, though it's short-lived as everybody returns to their original universes afterwards. The Citadel of Ricks is a refuge that various Ricks from across the multiverse use in order to guard themselves from the interventions of various planetary governments. Due to his long history of morally dubious actions, it's become a necessity to rely on the assistance of others to hide himself, largely so he gets the chance to let his guard down once in a while. But Rick being Rick, he refuses to actually accept the help that he needs, so he turns to the same source of comfort that any egoist man with a dimension-hopping portal gun would turn to, himself. But it's not as though the Council was his first choice in any dimension. During the following episode, and much later throughout the show, we see a past where Rick Sanchez served as a freedom fighter, alongside Bird Person and Squanchy, fighting against the Galactic Federation. But his days as an intergalactic terrorist ended, and he, at some point, decided to avoid involving others in schemes that could cause them harm the way it's cost him so much. So the Citadel not only serves as a monument to one man's ego, but a symbol of his own isolation. All of that said, the primary purpose of the Council of Ricks is really just another means of fueling the creative style of the showrunners. Look at all these weird, different-looking Rick and Mortys. I bet there's some weird stories behind them. It's the same sort of pointing and staring one might expect to do towards the bizarre alien world that the show takes us through. This sort of blending of the mundane and the fantastic are what keeps Rick and Morty so interesting. We can have a space station full of a bunch of different versions of the same two guys, but then develop the characters accordingly to bring the whole project down to Earth in its execution. It doesn't matter how weird and high concept the setting gets, as long as the characters behave and react realistically, the audience never gets pulled out of the experience. But it's not as though Rick and Morty is revolutionary in the way it handles this, and it's far from the only show to maintain this sort of dynamic. A well-known easter egg of this episode is the fact that a coffee cup, notebook, and a pen fly out of one of the portals Rick opens during the chase sequence. A direct reference to another show with a similar dynamic, Gravity Falls, run by Alex Hirsch, who is a close friend of Justin Roiland's. In fact, so many other shows have used this kind of formula in the past that Rick is even able to break the fourth wall about character arcs in the episode's conclusion, as he and Morty are leaving the Citadel. So then the only real thing separating the tropes of Rick and Morty from the realm of overuse is the execution of these tropes, which, for this part of the show's run, is strong enough to make the show stand above its peers. Rick's Key Business Beth and Jerry attend a Titanic reenactment together, leaving Rick, Morty, and Summer home together with the task of not ruining the house, at risk of Morty losing adventure privileges. Naturally, they throw a crazy party instead, with all of Summer and Rick's friends coming over to get, quote, riggedy riggedy wrecked. This party results in the house being transported to another planet, but since the atmosphere is oxygen rich with reasonable living conditions, Rick declares that the party is still on. He and Summer send all of the party poopers out of the way to snipe hunt, retrieving crystals with the assumption that they'll help return the house to Earth. In the end, Morty is forced to decide whether to clean up the house and continue adventuring with Rick, or if he wants to leave it messy and take his parents' side after Rick blew him off all night. In the end, the kids pick the status quo, all learning a bit about each other in the process. I've mentioned before that Rick and Morty is a show with nihilist themes, and this episode really helps to establish what that concept means to Rick as a character. He has sci-fi gadgets that can get the family out of almost any situation, and if those fail, he can simply find a replacement made at the Citadel, or find a new universe, or cheat his way out of the consequences in some other way. The fact of the matter is, in the world of Rick and Morty, nothing matters at all, and any suspense is purely fabricated in the interest of maintaining the status quo. Most adventures have some mundane utility in the long run. Morty risks his life for crystals that only bring a temporary high, not the first time he's put his grandson in danger for something petty, and certainly not the last. And so, of course, the only way for anything that happens to have genuine stakes is to have characters develop in response to those events. If the Earth is rendered uninhabitable, that's not that big of a deal, but if Rick loses the respect of a family member, it genuinely haunts him, no matter how much he pretends it, it doesn't. His nihilism rubs off a bit on Summer in this episode, giving her the first real bit of character development away from the status quo that she's received. Summer stops caring so much about what others think about her following her failure to develop her social status at this party, and decides to take more after her grandfather. And yet, in the same episode that we see her develop in this way, we also get a bit of a warning about this sort of mentality. 
Rick's catchphrase, Wubba Lubba Dub Dub, is explained by Bird Person as a sort of cry for help, something that he pretends to say ironically when in actuality the phrase very much applies to him. Humans are supposed to be social creatures, and recessing away from the people you're supposed to be close to means that you're depriving yourself of something important, something which Rick tries to fill the void with, with alcohol and adventure. But we do get some saving grace in the fact that Morty nearly makes a rejection of Rick and the associated lifestyle of Rick. After the previous episode made him doubt his position as a number two, a sidekick, and having his wants and desires ignored by Rick's indifference, Morty takes a more active rejection of his grandfather and accepts no longer going on adventures with him. But it only takes one grand gesture for this to be forgotten and the show to wrap up with an extremely tongue-in-cheek dance number. Season 1 Wrap Up The success of Season 1 led to a quick renewal and a Season 2, with the interest in Rick and Morty picking up very quickly to the point that the season finale had nearly twice as many viewers as the premiere. With the second season came new challenges, as well as new opportunities from old ones being cleared. In Season 1, there was an issue of the show trying to find its footing, figuring out how to work with sci-fi concepts in a way that didn't trivialize many of the plots. Rick's science borders on a constant deus ex machina source, preventing any real stakes to many of the plots. And there's also an inherent desire for the show to maintain a status quo, which can prevent characters from making meaningful developments. Despite these pitfalls, Season 1 does a much better job at navigating them than many of its contemporaries, with the first season establishing a proper tone and theme for the show to continue pulling from in the future. But in this way, first seasons of TV shows have it easy. It's difficult to claim that a show is going stale when it's still establishing setting and characters. But once those things are set in place, the writers have to deal with the challenge of building on that in not only a meaningful way, but a way that's a net gain to the show as a whole. So it's up to Season 2 to top what we got in Season 1, which, based on what we've seen so far, is going to be a monumental task. A Rickle in Time Following the time freeze at the end of Season 1, Rick, Summer, and Morty have finished repairing the house, but need a few hours to resolve their, quote, time, so that they're on the same wavelength as the rest of the universe again. Unfortunately, their uncertainty means that both Morty and Summer become trapped in multiple timelines, manifesting as the screen splitting to show the two extremely similar universes tenuously coexisting. Rick tries to undo the process by making sure that there are no potentials for their timelines to split further, but when this fails, he ends up just trying to kill his alternate self. Eventually, their antics attract the attention of the Time Police, who fix the issue, but then threaten to arrest Rick for stealing time crystals that made the plot possible in the first place. But Rick uses the power of uncertainty to outnumber the cop before eventually stealing his tech and fixing everything. In the B-plot, Jerry runs over a deer in the woods, and Beth tries to save its life in order to prove her worth as an animal surgeon. Right out the gates in Season 2, we start to see much higher concepts in the level of sci-fi that the show starts to rely on. While Season 1 largely focuses on deconstructing tropes from popular science fiction of the past, the second season takes a more thorough look at the current spectrum of scientific speculation in order to draw ideas. Season 1 will have the mutation of the week referred to by the effects creator they're referencing, but Season 2 has to have a layman's explanation of quantum mechanics before they can really start to explore the plot. This has some unfortunate ramifications later on, as rather than relying on the audience's cultural knowledge, it relies on their scientific knowledge for plots to work. It's much easier to say, we're doing the thing from inception, than it is to explain the concept of a memory parasite. And doing the latter means that the show starts to give the impression that they're trying to be a sci-fi edutainment show rather than a character exploration. And so, this in turn gives rise to the idea that, quote, without a solid grasp of theoretical physics, most of the jokes will go over a typical viewer's head. Beth spends the better part of the B-plot trying to save a deer that Jerry hit with his car, not so much because she has a deep intrinsic love of fauna, but because she feels as though she's looked down upon for being a horse surgeon instead of a human surgeon. On top of this, she's constantly denigrated by the veterinarian at the clinic she takes the animal to and the hunter who originally shot it, as if she doesn't have the right, much less the ability, to save the deer. Her whole drive for this episode is powered by ego, or trying to prove wrong anybody who might think she can't do something. In the end, it's Jerry who's able to strip away all of the distracting elements of the surgery so that she can save the deer's life and release it back into the woods. 
Jerry and Beth have their relationship repaired after the falling out in the previous episode, because Jerry genuinely believed in Beth's abilities, and Beth recognized that she was being recognized by someone who saw the best in her. Ultimately, it's the little details that make this episode great. Small things like the slight echo to the voices of the characters trapped in the time paradox, put in contrast to the non-delayed voices of Key and Peel, who voice the time police, that gives the extra layer of legitimacy to the setting. Morty Night Run Rick sells a gun to Crumbopolis Michael, an alien assassin, in order to get enough money to spend an afternoon at Blips and Chits, an alien arcade. But Morty feels remorseful that Rick is complicit in a murder, and decides to commandeer the ship in order to stop Crumbopolis Michael from killing again. He saves the lifeform, who assumes the name Fart, and then the duo go on the run from the Galactic Federation, as gaseous beings can't travel by portal. As they flee, there's a large amount of collateral damage, causing Morty to wonder whether it's worthwhile to save one life at the cost of so many others. In the end, Fart reveals that he is going to purge all carbon-based life forms from the universe once he returns from his own, and Morty decides to kill his new friend. Meanwhile, Jerry is dropped off at a cross-dimensional daycare for Jerry's who get brought on Rick Adventures by mistake. There, he worries about how patronized he is by Rick, but ultimately dismisses the thought with the emotional support of himself, Sizz. In the previous episode, we saw that Season 2 is more prepared to ramp up the complexity of its sci-fi concepts, and in just a second episode, we begin to see how Rick and Morty begins to develop its characters. Or rather, how it doesn't. You see, Morty decides that he's had enough of Rick's casual attitude, and decides to go behind his back and against his wishes, only to end up killing thousands and nearly wiping out humanity. In the end, Morty decides that it was wrong to go against Rick's wishes, and keeps his mouth shut for the next adventure. A similar thing happens twice more this season in The Ricks Must Be Crazy, and Look Who's Purging Now. So Morty's character development seems to take a backseat to allowing the sci-fi concepts to flourish without some boring moral quandary getting in the way. Jerry tries running away from daycare in this episode, only for the world outside the building to be strange and scary. He slunks back to the daycare feeling defeated, but copes with his failure by having the other Jerry's agree that nobody needs that headache. You get the impression that the story has played out many times, as there are Jerry's in the daycare, and yet there's something strangely wholesome about the entire setup. Rick knows Jerry so well that he was able to create a paradise for the man, complete with everything he could ever want out of his simple life. Rick could have very easily frozen Jerry and left him in the trunk, but sending him to a perfect world to distract him from where his son has been taken shows that there's at least some compassion inside of him. I've said before that Jerry and Rick actually have a decent amount of chemistry, and were it not for Rick's self-imposed detachment from other people, there's a chance the two of them could have been closer. If Krampopolis Michael wants somebody dead, he'll get them dead. It doesn't matter whether it's Rick selling him the weapon or somebody else. Rick knows this, and decides that if there's going to be an assassination anyway, he may as well profit off of it. Morty is portrayed as being in the wrong for caring. If he had only stayed detached, he could be enjoying life as Roy instead of being chased by the Galactic Federation. Yet at the end of the episode, Rick praises Morty for sticking to his morals and doing the right thing, despite all the issues that occurred. Sure, Rick doesn't know that Morty ended up pulling the trigger anyway, but this interaction shows that, in some small way, Rick envies Morty's ability to care about the universe, whether that's a sort of naivety or emotional strength. Autoerotic Assimilation while responding to a distress beacon, Rick, Morty, and Summer stumble upon Unity, an ex of Rick's who takes the forms of a body-infecting hive mind. He and the hive mind spend some time together while Unity also puts on some shows to entertain the children, but the whole situation doesn't sit well with Summer, and she begins trying to free the enslaved inhabitants of the planet. Summer soon gets her wish. Rick encourages her to take some drug analogs which cause her to lose her grip on the inhabitants. Once freed, they go back to what they were doing before, a race war. In the end, Unity leaves Rick because she takes what Summer said to heart, that Rick is a bad influence on her and his presence is dragging her down. In the B-plot, Beth and Jerry argue over the presence of an alien chained up in Rick's basement. Beth sides with Rick despite a lack of evidence that he's done anything right, and Jerry sides against Rick despite a lack of evidence that he's done anything wrong. In the end, they agree that Rick's lack of boundaries is putting a strain on both of them, and they start setting some boundaries. Boundaries that a now-depressed Rick accepts before going into his garage and failing a suicide attempt. <laughs> 
In the previous episode's rant, I mentioned that Morty's development has taken a back seat to give him more willingness to go along with Rick's schemes, but a major reason this doesn't feel as though Morty's simply being unpersoned from the show is the fact that his previous role as a backseat morality police has been taken over by Summer. While Morty nonchalantly goes along with the majority of the plans of this episode, Summer is new to being brought places, and as a result, tends to be much more vocal in speaking out against his worst actions. And just like Morty in Season 1, she also faces many of the consequences of daring to speak against Rick. Morty casually talks down to her for only just now experiencing her first race war. But this lack of blind faith ends up giving her a unique foil role to Morty. In Big Trouble in Little Sanchez, when Rick is trapped inside the body of his teenage self, Morty intrinsically trusts that Rick knows what he's doing and wouldn't make a mistake like that. While Summer doesn't blindly accept that his science is perfect and is the only one to realize there's a problem. Ultimately, Morty's stagnation as a character in this season only exists as a consequence of the showrunner spending more time to explore the side characters. Rick detaches himself from the rest of the world, declaring himself above all the pettiness of an indifferent universe. For the most part, this allows him to live a numb life, carefree when it comes to so much of the universe's flaws. But this episode shows that that sort of detachment is impossible. Rick claims not to care about anything, and yet when that exact attitude gets cited as the reason Unity doesn't want to spend any more time with him, he has to deal with two conflicting feelings. That the nihilism that he defines his personality by is false and he's just as vulnerable as the people he talks down to, or that that very same nihilism will force itself to take over his life as he continuously pushes away anybody who might save him from his self-inflicted mental prison. Beth and Jerry spend a majority of this episode arguing, itself a symptom of Rick's toxicity rubbing off on those closest to him. Beth hasn't had much of a family for years and is desperate to have some sort of connection to her father, but also has to deal with the fact that maybe no attachment is better than an unhealthy one. She takes out her frustrations on Jerry, but by the end of the episode realizes that she needs to take some responsibility for her own happiness. Total Rickall The Smith House is invaded by memory parasites, parasites that spread by implanting false memories into the heads of their host that makes them believe that the parasite has been known to them for years. Rick puts the house on lockdown, and tries to find the parasites, but constant flashbacks cause them to spread to the point that the false memories are able to overpower the real ones. Eventually, Morty pieces together that the parasites can only implant positive memories into the heads of their hosts, so the Smith family quickly arms anybody that they can remember in a negative way. After a shootout, they sit around for dinner while lamenting the loss of all the good people in their lives, when Beth shoots Mr. Poopy Butthole, yes, his actual name, because she has no negative memories of the fella. But in a twist ending, Mr. Poopy Butthole, he's a recurring character so get used to that, turns out to be real and just a really pleasant guy. I'll start off this rant section like I've done in the last few. In the previous episode, I explained that Summer is beginning to get much more characterization at the cost of screen time for characters like Morty, and this continues to be the case as we see other side characters get developed as well. Beth and Jerry are also developed more heavily in this season, and in this episode we get to see Jerry doubting his own existence as his psyche knowingly makes him a third wheel to Beth and Sleepy Gary's relationship. Even in the family's own memories, Jerry isn't the dominant male of the household, and the fact that the alien parasite picked up on this and ran with the idea actually reveals a little bit more about how they operate and thus we get vague allusions to Rick's backstory. The parasites depict him as a soldier in Vietnam among other adventure story plots, though this may just be something that the aliens have imprinted onto him due to the fact that he's holding a gun for a majority of the episode. As much as I try to stay objective in these videos, I have to admit that this is my favorite episode of Rick and Morty. It combines the strongest suits of the show, the light improvisation, spontaneous world building, and the pop culture parody slash deconstruction. The episode is based on the trope where a relative or family friend would be introduced into the cast late into a show's run and every other character would pretend that they'd been there all along when the audience knew better. The idea of a fake memory being sold to an audience is then sold as the conceit of the episode, with the family shooting at tropes that don't respect the audience's ability to keep track of continuity. All of this with an incredibly strong ending that only works because of how well the showrunners have sold the episode's plot, and a bit of neat continuity. The crystals Rick throws into the trash at the beginning of the episode are the crystals he got at the end of Morty Night Run, Alien Parasite Egg and all. Total Rick All is Rick and Morty at its very best, a standalone sci-fi plot that ties into ongoing serialized character stories, with the end result being far greater than the sum of any individual part.
Get Swifty. A giant head appears in the sky demanding to the denizens of Earth that they show me what you got. Rick then requests the use of a massive government soundstage and prepares to give them what he got by performing a live improvised song to satisfy their reality musical performance. The audition is a success and Earth is teleported to their galactic soundstage where they compete against other planets in a musical concert to the death as the losers are evaporated with plasma ray cannons. This turns out to be too much pressure for Morty, and he steals Rick's portal gun to save his family, only to need saving himself. In the end, Morty is saved by Bird Person, and he reunites with Rick to put on a concert that saves the planet. Elsewhere, the people of the Smith family's neighborhood panic and begin to worship the floating heads as their new gods. But the religion that crops up around floating head worship begins to change the whole family for the better. And since they're now mentally healthy enough to realize that they don't need to find acceptance from religion, they're tied to balloons and sent to space, saved only by Rick and Morty's performance and the realization that perhaps everybody was overreacting. By design, Rick's nihilist outlook on life is infectious. He tries to force those around him to adopt it under the threat of ridicule, and in this episode we learn that it isn't just about a desire for detachment and feeling above everyone else. Rick needs others to be detached, so he himself doesn't lose his cool under the weight of their negative emotions. If he can bring somebody along on his adventures who lacks both a grasp of what's going on and lacks the conviction to stand up to him about it, he can continue this facade. But if his adventuring partner is just as knowledgeable about the bizarre alien worlds as he is, and also not willing to go along with his antics, Rick has to face that his lifestyle is flawed. Worse so, that it's a criticism coming from a person who fully understands that lifestyle. As of this season, Morty is teetering on the edge of both of these concepts. He's beginning to stop questioning the weirdness of outer space, but is still generally okay with going along on a Rick adventure and trusting his grandfather's judgment. Maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but it's possible that this relaxed and detached attitude of Rick's is actually meant to be a reflection of Justin Roiland's more improvisational style. If you fret over every line of dialogue, you can end up overthinking the way you write your show, and so explaining away sci-fi concepts by making up a nonsense word will allow you to tell the same story without getting hung up on pedantic linguistic implications. Not because those criticisms can't be made, but because there's not an invitation to do so. Anybody who tries to figure out what a plumbus really is has completely missed the joke. Beth and Jerry also see their relationship patched up during this episode. The reason given is that the two of them have a supporting community in their new religion, as well as a closer bond with Summer, the remaining family the two of them have. Once again, we see just how much happier the two are without Rick. How his presence in their life makes their life worse due to his toxic behavior and insistence that everything go his way at the cost of everybody else's self-esteem and happiness. The Ricks must be crazy. Rick's car battery breaks down on the way back from a ball fondler's movie, and so he and Morty go inside to investigate the issue while Summer stays in the car. His battery contains a microverse, the inhabitants of which generate electricity, a portion of which goes to power Rick's car. The reason they're no longer powering his car, though, is the fact that another scientist within the microverse named Zeep has created his own microverse battery. And of course, that microverse is on the verge of losing its power to another scientist. But Rick and Zeep end up trapped inside the smallest microverse when the scientist there realizes that his whole universe is just an elaborate energy Ponzi scheme and crashes his ship with himself inside, stranding them. They eventually cooperate to create a way out, but once their troubles are behind them, Rick and Zeep race to escape the batteries and destroy the other scientist in a vindictive rage. In the end, Rick wins, and Zeep's race is once again enslaved with extra steps to ensure that Rick's car battery keeps working. Meanwhile, Rick's car tries to keep Summer safe without mentally scarring her. As a scientist with a limited moral code, Zeep and Rick are practically identical in terms of their methods of operation. The episode draws this comparison and leans heavily into the idea that, despite their similarities, the two cannot stand each other's presence. Which makes sense. Rick hates himself. It's logical that a man who acts just like him would be hated by him as well. And of course, any character that applies to Rick must apply to Rick-like characters too. Zeep and Rick are almost immediately at each other's throats, and part of Rick's plan at the start of the episode is to appeal to Zeep's sense of hypocrisy by showing off how flawed his own idea is. 
During this episode, Rick gives off the impression that he is totally unaware of the similarities between himself and Zeep, but how much of this is true is something that could be speculated on, considering he occasionally does show moments of regret for his life choices. But these moments are never in public, as he cares much more about the appearance of nihilism than the actual mentality of it. The way this episode builds on recursion shows off the strength of its writing, and just how many jokes can be set up and then built off of that concept. When Rick flips off the alien, he claims it means peace among worlds. Then, we don't need an explanation for when the alien president happily says, blow me. And of course, we later see Zeep giving his alien world a peace sign, telling Rick a similar lie about its meaning. The ability for a setup to have so many punchlines that build off of each other without getting repetitive is only enhanced by the fact that this was done while explaining as little of it as possible. The show not only respects its audience in this way by assuming they'll get the joke, but also by not padding runtime by repeating the setup. The end of this episode shows that Rick is fine with enslaving a race to power his battery, despite knowing full well that there's effectively a micro-him inside of it. He doesn't think too heavily about the ramifications of this, because it's not just about getting his car to start, but establishing a sort of dominance. Slavery is fine to Rick, as long as he's the one benefiting. Big Trouble in Little Sanchez After learning that there are vampires at her school, Summer asks Rick to implant his mind into a teenage clone of himself so he can hunt the undead with her. But Tiny Rick enjoys being a teenager too much to quit just because the vampires are killed, and continues the adventure through the next several days, reveling in his popularity. However, every time he dances or sings, he creates lyrics about how trapped he feels inside the body and how he's dying in a vat in a garage. Morty is undisturbed by this, mostly due to being distracted by riding Rick's coattails, but Summer sees the songs as a cry for help and frees Rick from his tiny body, which he reveals actually felt like a prison, and thanks Summer for noticing, before destroying the clones. While this is occurring, Beth and Jerry go to intergalactic couples therapy, where a living manifestation of each other's perceptions become codependent and wreak havoc on the facility. They're only stopped when the manifestations themselves start to reduce their own manifestations, and the two realize that, while they hate each other forwardly, there's still some small part of each other's psyche that's still in love. By the end of the episode, Beth and Jerry have salvaged their dysfunctional relationship with one another for about the fourth time so far. It raises the question of how their relationship can keep falling apart so often if it's constantly being saved, or if it's constantly being saved, how any of that saving can even matter if it just collapses on its own immediately afterwards. And from a more meta perspective, why bother writing plots where the two save their marriage repeatedly if the writers are just going to recycle the plot again later? It's as though in the interest of maintaining the status quo, Beth and Jerry have to continuously fix their marriage, because in its default state, there's no way it should even exist. It's not until the end of this season that this is finally taken to its logical conclusion, and in the season 3 premiere they finally go their separate ways. Is the constant focus on breaking and then repairing the Smith family marriage a meta-commentary on television continuity? Or am I reading too far into it, and it's just an example of continuity making plots uninteresting? It's as if the planet is threatened with destruction in every episode, except in Rick and Morty, the planet might actually explode at the end of the episode, because we've seen them abandon their home for a new one before. The only way that Rick is able to send an SOS to Summer and Morty is through music, or some other expression of angst. Because while Rick often likes to shield himself from noticing danger through ironic self-detachment, he typically knows when to call it off in the sake of self-preservation. But that's as an 80-year-old man. Teenagers are much more edgy and angst-riddled than adults are, and as such, Tiny Rick has trouble regulating his emotions. Combine this with Rick's existing unhealthy coping mechanisms, and we start to see why the inundation of young adults trying to replicate Rick's personality in the real world started to get on society's collective last nerve all those years ago. Interdimensional Cable 2 – Tempting Fate Jerry is sent to an alien hospital due to drinking some horrible experiment of Rick's out of the fridge. While he's being fixed, Rick, Summer, and Morty decide to do a sequel in Interdimensional Cable, even though they got it right the first time. As that's going on, Jerry learns that his penis happens to be the exact right specs to become a substitute heart for a transplant to be put into a universally renowned civil rights leader. Wanting to look good, he accepts the offer despite his doubts. He then later tries to renee on the agreement by convincing Beth to veto his decision, something he assumes she'll do because the two disagree on everything. But when Beth catches on to this, she agrees, and so Jerry has to resort to more extreme measures to get the alien surgeons to cut off his penis. 
Eventually, they realize that the surgery is unnecessary, as so many others have volunteered after finding out about Jerry's skittishness on the arrangement. But once he realizes that he's no longer needed for the operation, Jerry threatens the doctors to amputate, if only so he gets to be important again. In the end, Jerry is killed, revived, and nobody learns anything. Rick and Morty has never shied away from meta elements. We've seen so far that the writers draw heavily from pop culture and even embrace that they're doing a parody slash deconstruction by having the characters directly address that fact. Rick has ended episodes by yelling something like, roll the credits, acknowledging that the story is wrapped up and that they're not going to play with that concept any longer. He directly addresses tropes like character catchphrases and the improvisational writing style of the show, but in this episode we finally see the show start to really get interesting. Rick is no longer addressing the audience watching the show, but the audience discussing the show. It's subtle, but it's a new type of fourth wall break and one that will not only be brought up again, but will actively shape the way the show develops as time goes on. That isn't to say that Rick and Morty is unique in the way that paratext shapes text, but it's rarely so overt. To quantify some of the earlier statements, paratext refers to discussion about the show, while text refers to the contents of the show itself. So when Rick states that we pretty much nailed it the first time, he's not just talking to the audience, but he's talking about the audience, wondering why there would even be demand for the same plot to happen a second time. The episode even calls itself Interdimensional Cable 2. There's no ambiguity about it. The episode panders to the audience and gets away with it by acting as though they're doing so sort of begrudgingly. Is this really what you want? Well, our hands are tied. Jerry fully acknowledges his dysfunction in this episode, weaponizing it in an attempt to weasel out of his penisectomy. There, there's a proper word for that, someone in the comment section probably knows it, I just I don't want my search history to get too weird. While he's constantly shown as pathetic, this is the first time we see him come across as manipulative, and manipulating others by using the disdain others have for him. At a certain point, he almost wants to be the bad guy in others' eyes, not unlike how Rick is viewed, though Jerry ultimately lacks the confidence to really disappoint others, even if he inevitably does anyway. Look who's purging now. Rick and Morty stop by a purge planet while getting wiper fluid for Rick's windshield. A purge planet being one that does the thing from the movie Purge, so one night a year where they all kill each other. Rick wants to stick around to watch the purge happen against Morty's wishes, although those have never really mattered much. But when Morty sees a girl about to be purged, he convinces Rick to intervene, which winds up with the two stranded after she steals the ship. The two fight their way to a lighthouse so they can light a rescue beacon, in exchange for Morty listening to the Lighthouse Keeper's tale. But when the Lighthouse Keeper can't candle Morty's slight criticism, Morty shoves him down a flight of stairs, which helps drive him towards participating in the Purge fully. After some gratuitous violence, the two learn that the Purge is just something set up to get poor people to turn against each other, so the planet's ruling class can continue to exploit them. Right up until the girl Morty rescued purges them. The episode ends with a duo leaving as the surviving Purgies plan out a new society, repeating the same mistakes as before. So the season 2 finale was originally planned to be a two-parter, but the showrunners were having a difficult time coming up with ways to divide the episode, and ultimately pushed it back to a season finale plus season opener with season 3. This meant that there was one additional episode slot that had to be filled, and so Dan Harmon wrote this script in about a day. It checks out. The plot is a season 1 style rehashing of a movie plot, just with our characters making meta-commentary about it. The finale doesn't have too many twists that the original film and its sequels don't also make, and even acknowledges that the way the episode ends is a pretty gratuitous bloodbath. And naturally, since this plot was inserted into the season late in development, it has the least to do with any other episode. This is even lampshaded in a way, as a subplot with Jerry is literally about him being bored with nothing to do, and then asking Summer for money so he can indulge in a parasocial hobby. As disconnected as this plot is from the season as a whole, I still like this episode as it feels very Season 1 to me. Season 1, Rick was a much more scrappy, for lack of a better term, person than Season 2 and on Rick. We see Rick carry snakes around in a holster, as well as projecting skis out of his feet at will. He always was prepared for any situation through increasingly absurd subdermal implants. But here we get a Rick without access to as many of those technobabble devices. He has to survive on bluffing and improvisation, two things that show off intelligence much better than having him know how to get out of any situation because of something he prepared in advance off-screen. 
I should probably say this, since if I don't, it will get pointed out in the comments, but the idea of a purge day originated in Star Trek. In fact, the direction the plot takes much more closely resembles the Star Trek version of this plot in the first act, before devolving into the 2013 version, with a healthy amount of contemporary young adult fiction tropes thrown in. The Wedding Squanchers the Smith family attends the wedding of Tammy and Birdperson, despite Rick's frustration with the concept of marriage. The family mingles for a while while Rick drinks more and more, eventually warming up to the idea of opening up in the way that his best friend has so that he might actually have a shot at that same happiness. But the wedding is actually a scheme to get many of the Galactic Federation's most wanted in one place, as Tammy is a sleeper agent. So the Smith family has to go on the run from the government, settling on a new planet where they decide to wait out the rest of their lives. It's not until Rick overhears Jerry trying to convince the family that they should turn in their grandpa that he realizes that those closest to him have become his prisoner. He decides to follow Jerry's advice and give the family a shot at a new life, even if that life is under the Federation's rule. Rick is the bad guy of the show Rick and Morty. Obviously, most of the plots are a bit more nuanced than the simple good-bad dichotomy, but in general, Rick is the one driving force behind a majority of what goes wrong in this show. And even in cases where he just happens to be in the area, such as selling weapons to Grumbopolis Michael, he's still engaging enough with the story that it becomes irresponsible not to care how it resolves. Of course, from his perspective, he's not culpable for any of the suffering that happens. Rick emotionally detaches himself as often as possible, claiming that he's a creature of logic and reason. But thinking more critically, isn't it illogical to act in this way? Emotions exist for a reason. They drive us to do much more than to simply survive. Feeling accomplished is why we try to achieve great things in the first place. Feeling angry is why we stand up against injustices. Feeling sad is how we gain the empathy needed to cooperate with others. In this episode, Rick finally makes that first connection between his lack of caring and the extra caring that others have to do to compensate, how his family has to suffer the greatest for his missteps, and how he can't even shield himself from that suffering. Turning Rick into the Galactic Federation is something that the family attacks Jerry for even suggesting, but when Rick overhears this, he recognizes their anger for what it is, the Stockholm Syndrome of a group of captives, too afraid to anger their captor, like abuse victims sticking up for their abuser. Jerry is viewed negatively not for suggesting that the family try to save themselves, but for daring to disagree with Rick. And of course, if the situation were flipped, Rick would have no trouble doing the same. He would throw the whole family under the bus for a bit of temporary safety for himself. I mean, he and Morty abandoned the Smiths to die in Rick Potion number 9. This isn't even speculation. So after years of hurting those around him, Rick finally decides to do the right thing and take some personal responsibility. Rick and Morty's has so far taken a much more standardized approach to storytelling, a continuity reset after each episode that allows for a loose watch order where missing an episode isn't such a big deal. And while there have been some bits of continuity here and there, these have so far been meta-references and easter eggs. This episode marks a more solid point that the show begins to become more serialized, the plots of any episode potentially coming back in the future, whether it's planned so far or not. Season 2 Wrap-Up I would say that the major difference between the first and second seasons of Rick and Morty is that the second season is much more confident in itself than the first. Season 1 has somewhat of an ironic detachment from itself, parodying a sci-fi trope, but then turning to face the camera and saying that they're just reiterating plot beats from the source material or reiterating existing tropes. But in Season 2, there's a much greater focus on the originality of the stories and how they're explored. By this point, the writers have shifted to less parody and more originality, and have even begun to incorporate ongoing plots, such as the various allusions to the Galactic Federation throughout this season. Season 2 not only managed to top the quality of Season 1, but also the critical and financial metrics of the previous season as well. It managed to break the 2 million viewer count consistently, and was renewed for a third season only a few episodes into its run. So this newfound confidence, combined with the success of the new content, meant that the writers were more or less justified in whatever direction they wanted to take the show moving forward. Let's just hope that that confidence doesn't become hubris. The Rick Shank Redemption. While under arrest, Rick is placed into an interrogation chamber where the Galactic Federation scans his thoughts in order to figure out the instantaneous interdimensional travel that his portal gun uses. 
but unfortunately for them, Rick is too smart for their machines, and manages to take over the minds of various government officials, hopping from one to the next before he manages to get inside the Citadel of Rick's and crash it into the Federation's capital. He then infiltrates their financial offices and sets the value of the galactic currency from one of itself to zero of itself, crashing the society as it exists and making way for the status quo to return. During this plot, the Smith family is torn over whether the change to their lives is positive or not. Jerry has a bureaucratic job, at least it's implied that's what he does because he doesn't know himself but keeps getting rewarded. Beth drinks herself unconscious every day as there's no need for horse surgeons when the medical tech of their new world is sufficient to make horses live as long as tortoises. Summer wants to rescue Rick, but Morty takes her to the abandoned Cronenberg world to show her how losing Rick's toxicity is actually a good thing. Remember like three minutes ago when I praised the show not just for being more confident in its plot developments but its characters as well, and how the show was, in turn, able to make more definite character arcs as expressed by Rick finally taking responsibility for his actions and turning himself in to keep his family happy? Yeah, that got retconned in less than an episode. Rick's not actually a more responsible and mature person, it was all a bit in order to take over an evil government. His real character arc is all about trying to get some discontinued white vinegar and corn syrup. The whole episode ends up portraying an insecurity in the writing, as though the creators are too afraid to have their character show emotion, and to have to obfuscate any character building moment behind ironic detachment, as though their middle school is afraid of being called gay. But then, is this really such a shift for the series to take? Season 3 is a season where Rick has the most control over the Smith family, and as a result, the most control over what kind of plots we see the show tackle, so it makes sense that the show would begin to adopt the traits of its most dominant characters. In Season 2, Beth and Jerry were constantly working on fixing their marriage, a marriage which was fractured by the presence of Rick, and thus, there was a stronger anti-Rick presence in that season. Something that manifested as several episodes where Rick is shown to be in the wrong through his occasional expressions of misery with his life. This meant that Season 2 was much more prepared to examine Rick's negative aspects than before, and the character of Rick begins to push back. The season opens with Rick destroying everything and everyone who could possibly hold him accountable for his own actions. The universe is now his playground, something he can manipulate as he wishes without anybody telling him no. At least, nobody with any authority over him. Rick becomes more manipulative, more vindictive, and more irresponsible during this season. And since he's rejected the idea that his actions can affect the people closest to him, the only people whose behavior might cause him to change are the ones who exist outside the universe in which he lives. Okay, hang on everyone, things are about to get weird. Rick Mansing the Stone Rick, Summer, and Morty go on an adventure in order to avoid dealing with their personal issues regarding Beth and Jerry's divorce. The adventure is in a post-apocalyptic version of Earth, parodying Mad Max's diesel punk style. It's mindless fun, but eventually Rick finds the radioactive isotope he came there for, and the adventure has to end. But Summer's not done escaping from the reality of her life back home, and Morty soon joins her when he gets a singular beefy arm that helps him to vent his frustrations through violence. Rick also realizes that, if he returns home, he'll have to comfort his daughter, so he too stays in the post-apocalyptic dimension. But after the world is brought back to a level of comfort similar to ours, Summer learns that if she doesn't get over her parents' issues, she'll end up just like them. So the trio head back to their universe, fully moved past their issue. Distracting yourself from trauma is a decent first step in reacting to it, letting the initial wave of emotions pass and re-examining the event from a slightly but not too detached perspective. This is the reason first responders will give toys to children after accidents. But this distraction has to wear off, and the issue eventually needs to be addressed in order for the cycle of grief to resolve. And this cycle begins, crests, and ends through the course of this episode, all of which has the following end result. Summer and Morty are no longer sad about their parents divorcing, and can keep going on normal adventures like nothing is wrong. Of course, the characters need to process the divorce. If they didn't, then the show would come across as trite, as if nothing that happens really matters, so why should the audience ever be invested? This episode wears its metaphors on its sleeve. They're not incredibly obfuscated, and this is presumably done to make sure that nothing gets lost on the audience. Like, okay, they coped, let's move on, don't try to draw any more life lessons or comparisons from this. It would honestly come across as a cop-out if they did it any other way. If there was an obligatory get over it episode before things went back to normal, it would feel like the audience were being talked down to. If it wasn't addressed at all, it would feel like the audience would be looking down on the show. Ironically, it's that sort of emotional detachment that makes this episode resonate better, rather than worse. <laughs> 
The universe itself calls Jerry a loser multiple times in this episode. Literally, the wind whispers loser as a repeated gag. And yet, Jerry is the only person who has been inside of Rick's orbit and come out relatively unscathed. Consider that the people who he likes wind up like Bird Person or Squanchy, and the people that he dislikes turn into the remnants of the Galactic Federation. The fact that Jerry comes out with an apartment and some unemployment checks, more or less, means that he's gotten off pretty easily. So for the narrative to dunk on him and then turn around and pretend that Morty being constantly traumatized is a step up comes across as strange, though not unexpected. The real reason, I suspect, that Jerry is being written into a corner comes from the fact that he's no longer an interesting character. There are only so many things that can be done with a Jerry plot, and so the show pushes him aside, literally, to focus on the more interesting side of things. Things like, oh shit, the next episode's the pickle episode. Pickle Rick Rick transforms into a pickle, which makes him unable to go to family therapy. But his plan for turning back, a syringe full of anti-pickle serum attached to a timer on the ceiling, gets confiscated by Beth when she calls the bluff on his denial. So he has to survive as a pickle on his own, commandeering the brains of roaches, then rats, then office supplies as he fights his way through a group of action movie villains. Eventually, he makes his way to Beth during her therapy session, interrupting a conversation about how Rick's power dynamic forces the family into situations where they act up instead of working through their problems. The Season 3 promotional material made a big deal out of Pickle Rick, but the community surrounding the show made an even bigger one. A rough cut was shown at San Diego Comic Con in 2016, and the hype only built from there. People tattooed Pickle Rick onto their bodies, they yelled Pickle Rick in public spaces, they shifted conversations towards the show, the United States Air Force uses a call sign referencing the bit. People renamed their Twitter accounts in honor of the scientist slash vegetable. The episode aired and was nominated for a Golden Reel. It won a Primetime Emmy for Outstanding Animated Program and an Annie Award. But perhaps the best summary of the public's reaction is as follows. He turns himself into a pickle. Funniest shit I've ever seen. The split between the A and B plots of this episode are emblematic of the split between the two ways the show tells stories in general. Rick does cool science shit to a bunch of sewer animals, and then fights his way through a bunch of nameless mooks. In the end, there's a big explosion, and he says something about the multiverse as he flies away. The B plot is the family in a literal therapy session that consists mostly of a single character looking directly at the audience, and explaining character motivations in simple, unambiguous words. The show's violence in this episode is toned up, reflective of the third season as a whole. Character injuries are more likely to erupt into an explosion of gore instead of the more subtle but still rather grotesque injuries of the show's past. But it overall shows a stronger commitment to both sides of the spectrum. Most of Rick's setup and planning is not shown. We see him overcome a single obstacle, such as mobility, and then it's implied he'll manage to build a more elaborate system out of that. By the time he's slaughtering a building full of goons, we don't care exactly how he's setting up all his devices, the audience is just there for the end result. So the question has to arise, how much of this was intentional? If it wasn't that intentional, then am I looking too deep into things, and if I'm looking too deep, then why praise something so surface level so thoroughly? If audiences are genuinely enthralled by Rick yelling, Pickle Rick, then perhaps the show having a tongue-in-cheek over-the-top slaughterfest is just pandering to the lowest common denominator of fandom. If there really was a deeper metaphor to the entire episode, then are general audiences that receptive to it? Maybe Rick and Morty fans really are all geniuses, or maybe it's a dichotomy that the show intentionally tries to ride the line between. But these lines blur, and soon the idea of the Rick and Morty syncophant starts to escape fandom, spreading into the general public and turning common sentiment against the community, and later the show itself. Pickle Rick was the beginning of the end. Vindicators 3, The Return of World Ender Morty cashes his Morty Adventure card, the concept from Me Seeks and Destroy, in order to answer a literal call to adventure from the Vindicators, a group of intergalactic heroes who fight evil wherever it may be. But the duo learns that they're not participating in a Vindicators 2, but Vindicators 3. They had an adventure without Rick and Morty, citing Rick's personality as a reason to leave him behind. They're proven right, vindicated if you will, when Rick gets blackout drunk and defeats World Ender for them, then sets up a saw trap to prove to Morty that the members of the Vindicators aren't all they seem to be. The morality of Rick and Morty is less various shades of black, white, and gray, and more various shades of black. 
Few characters are unequivocally good or even biased towards doing more good than bad. If a character has some good in them, it's just a speck here and there, just enough that the audience doesn't start actively rooting against them. In this way, the concept of a hero or even protagonist doesn't truly exist. The only characters we as an audience root for are the characters whose perspective we see. In this episode, Rick is the villain. He kills the villain and then takes over his lair, threatening to kill the heroes as well as himself and Morty. And yet the framing paints Rick as more sympathetic than he deserves. He's cool-headed and right to kill the Vindicators after all. They're morally gray because they blew up a planet once. Rick has done much worse, but again, he's the hero because we see his side of everything. It's not as though this is the first episode to introduce this sort of dynamic. In The Ricks Must Be Crazy, we get to witness another scientist on the same level as Rick Sanchez, creating a mini-universe of slaves as a power source. But while Zeep is using his microverse to create sustainable energy for an entire society, Rick uses his to power a car. Zeep is morally better off than Rick, but Rick is the character we follow and thus root for. And while it's not a given that audiences and showrunners alike are going to view Rick as perpetually right, the previous episode even points out very many of his flaws, there's still a large enough general audience out there who are willing to tattoo Pickle Rick onto their bodies. So as long as there are people who still haven't picked up on the message, Rick and Morty can still continue to get mileage out of plots that poke fun at Rick's superiority complex. Rick's mentality that there are no such things as heroes ties into his own view of himself, in that he's using it as a defense mechanism to avoid anybody, least of all Morty, putting any sort of faith into him. If Morty idolizes Rick, then Rick will only ever disappoint and hurt him. If Morty resents Rick, then Rick loses an assistant for his adventures. So he has to balance the boy's mentality between the realms of love and hate, settling on indifference in order to ensure a constant stream of loyalty. There are no heroes, there are no villains, there's just Rick. The Whirly Durly Conspiracy Rick feels sorry for Morty, who feels sorry for Jerry, and so Rick decides to take Jerry on an adventure in order to cheer him up. They arrive at a resort inside of an immortality field, where the gimmick is that you can't be killed, and they share a few drinks. Jerry is met by Risotto Groupon, an old enemy of Rick's who tells him that there's a roller coaster, the Whirly Durly, that peeks outside of the field for a split second, long enough to kill Rick, and asks Jerry to conspire with him in order to take the man out. But Jerry changes his mind about the murder at the last second and warns Rick of the conspiracy. This makes Rick turn against Jerry again, though not so much that he won't help him return home. But on the way home, Rick is subjected to a field that incapacitates him so that he can use interstellar travel. And Risotto Groupon takes advantage of this moment to finally finish the assassination. Jerry saves Rick's life during this moment and the two part almost on good terms. In the B-plot, Summer tries to use a growth ray on her breast to make her next boyfriend jealous, but accidentally makes herself into a giant. Morty tries to call Rick for help, but Beth refuses to accept that help and tries to fix the issue herself. At first, she makes things worse by using science, but then she decides to simply talk it out, or rather growl it out, woman to woman. Rick and Jerry have always existed as opposites, but sometimes an opposite manifest is more of a mirror image than a negative. Both men have massive egos relative to their position in the world, but only Rick has the credibility to back that ego up. Lacking the intelligence or adaptivity of Rick, Cherry has to protect his ego by backpedaling and coming across as too pathetic to bother with. In his own words, he just keeps crawling, and that keeps working. That said, a large number of the challenges that either character faces come from different sources. Many of Rick's challenges are self-imposed, if not self-inflicted, whereas everything that tests Jerry is something that's thrust upon him. He doesn't have the willpower to actively seek out change and excitement, whereas Rick values his self-worth on the adventures that he has. Interestingly, this means that Rick is never happy with himself, as he's constantly trying to prove himself more and more, whereas Jerry is more satisfied with his boring and monotonous life. Well, not happy, but not nearly as miserable as Rick is. Beth is still struggling to find herself in her relationship with her father. Rick is such a domineering part of her life that without him around, she's incomplete as a person. Before, this was simply something that she could blame on her marriage. She's stuck to Jerry, who holds her down, and so her home life can be blamed for all of her interpersonal issues. But now that she and Jerry have separated, she no longer has any excuses for her lacking identity. In this episode, she tries so many different things in order to avoid asking her father for help, trying to prove that she's capable of doing things without him. And Beth succeeds. In the end, the one thing that Rick was never able to ruin for her was her ability to parent. Rick was an absent father, so of course Beth can't learn how to raise a family from him. And thus, the one way of fixing her issues with Summer that doesn't involve a collapse of her own ego is to solve her issues with parenting, 
If she can do that, then she's finally moved out of the label of Rick's daughter and earned the label of Morty and Summer's mom. Rest and Ricklaxation After a particularly harrowing adventure, Rick and Morty go to a spa in order to properly relax. While there, they have all of their toxins removed and placed into a tank, leaving them refreshed and positive. The duo begin to live much better, happier lives. Morty becomes popular at school, never letting anything get him down, and Rick stops worrying so much about small things, mellowing out and liking himself again. But unbeknownst to them, their toxic selves survive the separation, and toxic Rick MacGyver's a means of escaping into the real world by tricking Rick and Morty into swapping places. But when that fails, toxic Rick decides to simply make the whole world toxic instead. But Rick is able to refuse with him by threatening his toxic Morty's life, as toxic Rick still holds attachment to the boy. But even with this plot taken care of, the new Morty refuses to refuse, and Rick has to scheme to track him down and forcibly reunite Morty with his toxic self as the new Morty was healthy enough to recognize that being near Rick was a negative thing. Both Rick and Morty lose their negative aspects in this episode, and one of the most distinctive lost features is their mutual codependency. Since the removed toxic aspects are parts of their personalities that they themselves view as toxic, this means that both Rick and Morty believe that their relationship is a toxic one, that they'd be better off without each other. In Morty's case, we see that this is true. He's become wildly successful without Rick's influence, but as for Rick, he loses his toxic traits and arguably becomes worse. Without Morty around, he loses a lot of his intelligence, or at least his cold-hearted logical side. New Rick is able to be fooled by Toxic Rick easily, and he lacks the ability to see that Morty is no longer going along blindly with his schemes to recombine. The ultimate conclusion of this episode is that Rick needs Morty much more than Morty needs Rick, and combined with what we've seen from episodes like Rick's D Minutes, it's very likely that everyone else would be better off without Rick too. It's Morty's confidence that wins over many new friends and lovers. Without Rick constantly putting him down, Morty is capable of great things, but the plot of the episode is largely spurred on by the fact that Morty dismisses the probability of anything going wrong, convincing Rick that there's nothing to be worried about. Ordinarily, the plot of an episode of Rick and Morty is spurred by Rick's actions or his irresponsibility, so without their toxic traits, this reality is flipped. Morty's manic anxiety is what allows him to stay wary of danger. Rick's ego is what allows him to push himself beyond his human limits. Without negativity, both of these characters actually come across as much more static, and it's completely possible that the only reason Morty was able to grow into a successful person after having his toxicity removed is because his positive traits were able to grow in response to his negative ones. Everything is brought back to the status quo by the end of the episode, and the world nearly being destroyed by toxicity is ostensibly a justification for why this always has to happen. If the characters grew in a perfectly sensible way and learned from every mistake they made, they would end up with a Rick and Morty who are much less interesting and unique as a result. But it's not as though this is a new thought. After all, we only relate to fictional characters in the first place because of their weaknesses and flaws. The Rick Lantis Mix-Up, or Tales from the Citadel Rick and Morty go on a wacky adventure to the sunken city of Atlantis. They don't check out an ensemble plotline involving the reconstruction of a brand new citadel, because that would be pandering. But on the citadel, we follow a few different groups as they each perceive an ongoing political struggle about the divisions between Rick's and Morty's. A group of four schoolboy Mortys being re-educated as better sidekicks for Rick take a trip to a wishing portal in a coming-of-age story similar to Stand By Me. A factory worker Rick kills his boss in a rage and takes over, only for his rampage to be captured and used as fuel for a happiness-flavored wafer. A new Rick on the beat gets partnered up with an experienced and corrupt Morty, and a Morty runs for president, campaigning on the idea that the real divide isn't between Ricks and Mortys, but the classes of Rick. That is, until he wins and purges the existing structure of the Citadel, forcibly removing the shadow rulers of Rick's society and replacing them with a new way of living. In the end, it's revealed that the new Morty president is none other than the evil Morty from Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind. Season 3 is by far the most meta season of Rick and Morty so far. We're most likely to see overt references to paratext surrounding the show's production and community, such as Rick and Morty effectively announcing that the Citadel of Riggs is not an important ongoing plotline to the story as a whole, and that this episode is just there to appease the people who care less about non-serialized standalone sci-fi adventures and more about the deeper ongoing plotlines behind the scenes, throwing a bone to those demanding a more serialized story, then going back to a bunch of silly standalone tales with no real connection to anything else. 
It's as if the showrunners are acknowledging that there's a split between mindless fun and the deeper drama. Rick and Morty has always been good about finding a balance between these two concepts, and moments like the pre-opening scene from this episode are just the showrunners acknowledging that they could try significantly less hard and still get away with everything. Tales from the Citadel was originally advertised as the Rick Lantis mix-up, so as not to spoil the fact that the previously destroyed Citadel would be rebuilt. Episode titles are released before the season even airs, and this was a way to avoid the potential spoilers that the secondary title might carry with it. The episode itself follows two Ricks, one who is more experienced in the ways of the Citadel who has been working a factory job for years, and one who is a newbie cop, inexperienced in the systemic issues the Citadel faces and how people trying to survive reinforce these systems. We also follow two groups of Mortys. One group is younger and trying to find some sort of meaning to a rickless existence before it all goes away. The other group is more experienced as they run a political campaign to try and fix things. The key takeaway from these stories is the fact that nobody is truly happy where they are, with the exception of Rick and Morty's C-137, the duo we follow in every other episode. Mortys don't want to be cooped up in a citadel. They're supposed to be teenagers going on adventures with their grandpas. Ricks aren't meant to be working meaningless factory jobs. They're supposed to go to Atlantis with their grandson. The episode itself takes one extreme of the serialization versus standardization dichotomy and shows its flaws. Morty's Mind Blowers Morty begs Rick to remove the memory of everything from his head after being traumatized on an adventure, so Rick shows him an underground room full of Morty's Mind Blowers, a room full of extracted memories that Morty wanted removed in order to prevent trauma. The duo relive these moments together, a bunch of disconnected stories that serve as a clip show but for scenes we've never seen. And this is what they do instead of Interdimensional Cable 3. But Morty starts to realize that some of the memories were removed for Rick's benefit, as they were events that made him look bad. After a scuffle results in the duo both losing all of their memories, Morty starts rebuilding his psyche, exclusively through all of his worst memories, before turning on Rick. In the end, Summer stumbles upon them, comments that they've done this before, and presses a reset on continuity. The previous episode, Tales from the Citadel, serves as a mirror to this episode in that, while the Citadel contained multiple stories that built on an ongoing serialized plot, Morty's Mind Blowers is a loosely connected series of short skits with no ongoing relation to the show as a whole, insofar as developing character dynamics are concerned. This is even referenced in a meta way. Rick removes memories from Morty's head that are sufficiently traumatizing, as well as those that damage his reputation as an infallible genius. If these memories stayed, their dynamic would be changed as a result. The fact that Morty's mind blowers exist is a testament to just how far Rick is willing to go to maintain a level of continuity, reinforced by the previous episode, where the duo were excited about not visiting the Citadel so they could have mindless fun in Atlantis instead. The show has a split between serious, serialized drama and the mindless sci-fi fun, and this is an episode that intentionally leans as far into the latter side as possible. There's even somewhat of a continuity error in this episode that I think serves as more of a reinforcement of the standardization discussion than an accidental issue. Morty learns that squirrels can communicate, and the squirrels attack him, forcing Rick to have to find a new universe for the duo. This is treated as something with the same severity as the replacement dimension from Rick Potion No. 9, but it's in a deleted memory, something that by design can't be important enough to be referenced again. Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland have mentioned before their disdain for cheap plot resolutions, a character using time travel or some other deus ex machina to escape the consequences of a plot can severely damage the reputability of any threat the writers create in the future. If the characters have to do the replacement universe trick, it's shown as a traumatizing experience for Morty. No longer a cheap cop-out as there are legitimate consequences for the characters' psyches. So to turn around and have Rick pull this trick twice is a sort of tongue-in-cheek way of acknowledging that this sort of plotline is worthy of being deleted, erased from memory. And of course, the way that this episode ends is an acknowledgement of how many other shows end every single episode. The characters have their memories wiped slash restored and everything gets to continue on, as though this episode never happened. Far from a proper story resolution, but then again, all done in such a way as to never condone this style of storytelling. The ABCs of Beth Beth recalls her girlhood adventures when a childhood acquaintance of hers was cannibalized by his father, and she coped by saying that he merely got lost in her imaginary Froopy Land. But Rick reveals to her that Froopy Land was real, and that her friend Tommy really did get lost in there. They travel inside a rainbow doorway to confirm this, and discover that he's been impregnating the imaginary creatures and then cannibalizing his children for sustenance. But more importantly, they learn that Beth takes after Rick far too much more than she's comfortable with. 
While Beth is trying to do the right thing by rescuing Tommy, she ends up refusing to apologize and simply kills him instead. So Rick and Beth clone a new Tommy and set everything back to normal, while Rick gives Beth the opportunity to run away from her responsibilities via a clone with her memories taking over. In the B-plot, Jerry starts dating an alien huntress named Kiara, a ploy to make Beth jealous that backfires when he ends up far in over his head with no idea how to break off the relationship. The popularity of Season 3 brought on a new wave of writers for Rick and Morty, and with those new writers came new perspectives and directions for episodes to head in. Namely, the addition of female writers gave us more nuanced character arcs for Beth and Summer. While these two existed as slightly more than background characters in the past, we finally get to see the two evolve into proper human beings, living in the world just as much as the titular Rick and Morty. Beth in particular is able to recognize the role her father plays in her life as a negative influence, but still has enough of an attachment to him that she refuses to let go of that toxicity. She does all of this despite knowing that she's only going to end up more and more like him, pushing those closest to her away, and yes, that will eventually include Rick himself. Summer also serves as a new voice of reason to Rick in these later seasons. As Morty becomes more and more jaded by everything he sees, the dynamic between him and Rick shifts. And while this allows for a slightly different style of storytelling, the classic Rick and Morty adventures we know and love get substituted for Rick and Summer adventures. Both of these plotlines deal with abandonment issues, Beth to Jerry and Rick to Beth. Beth leaving Jerry was something that's portrayed as an action for everybody's benefit. Their relationship was toxic and this hurt the kids as much as it hurt each other. And while Jerry is in his relationship with Kiara, he's shown to be slightly better off. Still miserable and still in a one-sided relationship, but at least his apartment is clean. And Rick's abandonment of Beth as a child was something meant to protect her. If she hadn't been shackled down to Jerry in her suburban monotony, then the obvious trajectory for her life would have been to wind up like her father, miserable and alone as she searches the universe for meaning. In this episode, Beth finally acknowledges the extent to which her relationship with Rick is a toxic one. She's wanted to be just like him her entire life, but once she's finally achieved that goal, she's also learned enough about her father to understand that her girlhood dream of being just like him was misguided, as well as a dream that was doomed to come true from the very beginning. The Rick Churian Morty Date Rick and Morty are given a top-secret task to eliminate a monster living beneath the White House, but because the task is boring, they blow off the president to play Minecraft. This upsets the president, who declares Rick and Morty domestic threats and exiles them from the US. Rick is undisturbed by this, and continues adventuring normally, much to the annoyance of the president, who is consistently one step behind them. He fights Rick in a gratuitous display of sci-fi tag before eventually Rick is forced to call off the fight as he has accidentally convinced Beth that she's a clone of herself and will have to be terminated for being self-aware. When Rick meets with Beth, he finds that she's sequestered herself with the rest of the Smith family, Jerry included, eventually resigning herself to understanding that the existential crisis of living underneath Rick's thumb is not worth the hassle, and that she's happier with a simple life surrounded by simple people. Having lost his role as the most respected member of the family, he eventually resigns to allow the president to believe that he's fled the universe in order to repair their relationship and bring the family back to the season 1 status quo. One of the most common sources of content for Rick and Morty comes from taking science fiction and pop culture concepts and giving a realistic twist to them, a deconstruction of the type of jaded and cynical personalities that would inevitably result from the constant exposure to this sort of danger and excitement. But one thing that's rarely come up until this point is the mundane world's reaction to this sort of high-concept stuff. The only real glimpse we've seen of this dynamic has been in episodes like Get Swifty, which of course also features the president pretty heavily. So while the rest of the show is about the kind of characters who are used to coexisting with weird space science, this episode shows us the opposite. The layman's exposure to Rick's world, and how and why those worlds often remain so separate. Because it's one thing to show fake situations with real consequences, it's another to show fake situations happening to real people. Beth has an existential crisis over the idea that her life is boring, because all things said, it shouldn't be. While a character like Jerry thrives in normalcy, characters like Beth and Rick resent that sort of monotonous living, and feel suffocated when they're doing the same thing day in and day out. Which raises the question of why Beth ever let herself become the type of person who lives that way in the first place. When Rick mentions that he could have cloned Beth, she realizes that if any part of her wants to accept that offer, then a part of her probably did. She accepts her role in the existential horror of it all, and accepts that that may mean her own death. But even after resolving that idea, she still realizes that the only reason she even needs to worry about her own sentience being a problem is because of Rick. Of course, most people will have an existential crisis at some point in their lives, but these are usually answered by buying an expensive car, not worrying about a scientist coming to kill you. 
At the end of this episode, the real loser is Rick. The reason for this loss doesn't come from any immediate failure on his part, but rather a moral success on the part of those around him. The Smith family all realize at once that he's the worst part of their lives, and if he wants to be a part of those lives, he has to start recognizing that he can't be the center of everybody's story, just his own. Season 3 Wrap Up Following Season 3, there was a gap longer than two years before Season 4 would air its first episode. In fact, while the show typically received a renewal within the first month of the first episode of a season airing, Season 4 didn't get an official green light until nearly five months after the previous season concluded. But that renewal didn't come in the form of a simple request for ten more episodes. Rather, it was a 70-episode renewal, nearly unheard of in television, much less adult animation. So now we've got Rick and Morty Forever 100 episodes, 10 seasons. There's nowhere to go but up, presumably. The third season was the most popular one yet, with only one episode dipping beneath the 2 million viewer threshold, and that was only because it aired on April Fool's Day with no announcement. Season 3 represented a tumultuous relationship between the show's creators and the show's fans. One that represented emotions very nearly resembling disdain. People idolized Rick and wanted to be just like him. They thought he was cool and an aspirational role model. But people who idolize Rick are missing the point of the character. Despite his intelligence and abilities, he's a deeply miserable person, who ends up with a less happy ending than Jerry of all people. To idolize Rick is to idolize not only an impossible standard to live up to, but a standard that's not even portrayed as something good or enjoyable to achieve. When picking out fictional characters to model yourself after, it's best to try and choose somebody who's going through a similar experience to what you're going through and fighting through in an admirable way. You won't be traveling through dimensions in your life, but you may encounter familial strife and existential dread, and Rick is not a character who deals with either of the latter issues especially well. Edge of Timorty Rick Die Rick Pete Rick and Morty gather death crystals, crystals that allow the person touching them to see the various potential ways they're going to die. When touching one of these crystals, Morty sees that it's a very likely end for him to die in Jessica's arms. So he commandeers Rick's ship and crashes it, killing the scientist. A hologram Rick appears trying to convince Morty to take a tissue sample so Rick's mind can be placed into a clone and he can evade death. But since the crystal isn't guiding Morty towards that course of action, he refuses to resuscitate his grandfather. Under the future guidance of the crystal, Morty manages to become the enemy of the government, get arrested, then talk his way out of a prison sentence as though he were safe scumming high rolls in an RPG. Meanwhile, Rick is continuously being revived into different realities, trying to return to his own despite the increasingly authoritarian universes he finds himself in. When he does manage to return, he's found Morty abusing his tech to live in stasis and rescues him from the influence of his own desires. In the end, the duo make the meta decision to have fewer high-concept journeys and more story-of-the-week adventures. There's probably some sort of analogy here about the fact that the fascist Morty is the one who demands that Rick go through regular disconnected stories about things and concepts they've done before. This, and the idea that in order for Morty to get his desired happy death, he has to become a murderer and eventually isolate himself in the desert to stay stagnant until the moment he's waiting for happens. There's an implication that, without the freedom to experiment with storytelling styles and to avoid falling into predictability, the show will be significantly worse off. If the audience goes into a season or episode of Rick and Morty knowing what to expect, then the show will lose a part of its soul and no longer be worth watching. Morty completely loses his freedom to the crystal in an attempt to live a solved life. And while all of this is going on, Rick has the opposite arc. He spends his half of the episode going through several zany alternate realities, and instead of exploring any of them, just wants to go back home to what he's used to. At the end of the episode, Rick and Morty, both the characters and the show itself, express a desire to find a middle ground, never writing their laurels and continuing a trend in order to squeeze out as much money from the franchise as possible, but never getting so experimental as to lose what made the show so beloved in the first place. There's an expression of annoyance with the type of audience member who would demand either extreme that comes across as the showrunners directly addressing the viewers at home, who spend more time talking about Rick and Morty than they do watching it, saying, stop telling us how to run the show, and just let us do what we want to. And to anybody who has been following the show since the beginning, they'll know that this is the mentality that Rick has been embodying since episode 1. He never tries to live in the future or the past, just accepting whatever happens and improvising to get as much out of the present moment as possible. And while we're shown repeatedly that this isn't the best way to live one's life, this episode also shows us that there are many significantly worse ways to go about living, too. 
The Old Man and the Seat Rick tries to hunt down and shame Tony, the man who has been using his private toilet, only to slowly grow more attached to his persistence and regularity in Rick's life. When Rick finally decides to give up on the chase and accept that Tony can use his toilet freely, albeit by setting a trap that makes fun of him, he learns that the alien died in an accident and laments the loss of a rival. Meanwhile, Jerry decides to develop an app with Rick's intern Glutie, despite the Do Not Develop My App warning tattooed on his forehead. The app ends up being an algorithmically perfect dating app that continuously hooks people up with their soulmates in order to distract them from the fact that an alien mothership is stealing all of their water. But Morty and Jerry work together to take the app down, inspiring Glooty to put an ad wall around it. Despite the Earth very nearly being consumed by a romantic apocalypse, the Smith family remains unaffected by the influence of the app, with the exception of Summer. The exploration of why each individual family member is not affected reflects their own personalities. Both Rick and Morty are too busy with sci-fi adventures to bother with downloading the app and finding romantic fulfillment. Jerry uses the app, but due to having no matches, is left to the same devices he's always had in his loneliness. Summer falls for the app predictably, but this is largely due to her having the least influence from Rick of the Smith family. While Morty was just as hormonal a teenager, his horniness even starting plots like Rick Potion No. 9, he's had his more carnal desires knocked out of him by the jaded cynicism of Rick, although he does still have the occasional relapse. And of course, Beth is far more concerned with protecting her daughter than she is with finding her own happiness. Sacrificing her own potential happiness in order to provide for her family is something she's been doing since the show began, so this doesn't come across as surprising. And of course, the family down on Earth aren't the only ones to have a love story in this episode. Rick slowly develops an attachment to Tony through the episode, and while it's not a romantic or even carnal love like others are experiencing, it's still the same type of attachment that can consume a person's thoughts and actions. Rick is the type of person who lives his life as isolated as possible, and he has tailor-made a perfect bathroom designed to appeal to everything that he wants and needs out of a restroom. So when he meets a stranger who's willing to go to great lengths to experience that same feeling, there's an obvious connection. If somebody's version of paradise is your version of paradise, then perhaps your souls have some sort of connection. But in his typical antagonistic way, Rick manages to keep Tony at arm's length through all of their time together. He never truly learns what it was about their shared toilet that he loved the most. As a result, when Tony dies, Rick has to deal with the fact that he'll never truly know what kind of bond they shared, only that they had something special, and now it's gone. Of course, Rick could simply clone a new Tony and replace the man. He's done similar things before. Tony's death is more of a metaphor for the fact that Rick has pushed away somebody that he shouldn't have. One Crew Over the Cuckoo's Morty Rick and Morty learn that one of their adventures has been heisted by a professional heistmeister, so Rick puts together a crew to get into a heisting convention so that he can put together a crew to perform a heist off, the purpose of which is to put together a crew to stop a heisting robot that put together a crew to heist Rick's heist. It's revealed that the entire heist was merely a heist to put together a crew that would enable the robot to put together a crew that heists more heists and puts together more crews until the entire world is one big crew put together for the ultimate heist. But then it's revealed that Rick had put together a crew to heist the robot's heist and that the entire thing was just an elaborate plan to make the phrase put together a crew and the word heist lose all meaning to Morty who was putting together a script for a new heist movie. One major change that has occurred slowly since the beginning of Rick and Morty was Rick's level of preparedness for every possible contingency of everything that could possibly happen. Whereas in early seasons, Rick was often improvising his way through tough situations, the later episodes of the show have given Rick near omnipotence in everything, which drives an observation. Where is the tension in Rick and Morty? If Rick is effectively a god, then how can we possibly have an interesting story with any level of stakes? We know he's going to build some sort of deus ex machina machine that fixes all of his problems, so why even get invested in the first place? The normal solution is that his external problems rarely remain engaging, as they're just excuses for the internal conflict that the Smith family experiences. We've seen Rick turn himself into a pickle and then find his way through a warehouse of goons, and in the same episode he also fails to even acknowledge any of his familial issues. So at a certain point we have to ask why the external plots are even there. Why bother introducing some sci-fi concept if we know it's just an excuse to explore character drama? Why not turn Rick and Morty into a substanceless soap opera at this point if we won't lose any tension by doing so? And this episode provides the answer that dumb mindless fun can be worthwhile on its own. The entire heist plotline is stupid and pointless. It devolves into a playground argument between a bunch of nine-year-olds, declaring that they have laser guns and laser gun-proof shields and laser gun-proof shield-breaking grenades and so on. 
Rick's genius in this episode is something parodied and made fun of, but rather than saying that something can be used to explain away any plotline is inherently a negative, it makes the point that Rick's intelligence is not the point of the show. Trying to make sense of the heists on top of heists on top of heists is as much a waste of time as trying to make any sense of Rick's gadgets, as well as coming up with explanations for why he doesn't bring back old concepts more often. Rick is able to create a clone of anybody, so why is death considered a threat? The answer? Because that makes for a more interesting story. Claw and Hoarder, Special Rickdoms, Morty. After going along with Rick on another ridiculous adventure, Morty demands the dragon that Rick promised him off-screen. So Rick consults a wizard and has a dragon, Baltramau, sign a blood contract with Morty, soul bonding them together. After a few days of a one-sided relationship that annoys the rest of the family, Rick sets out to terminate the dragon, or at the very least threaten him to go away. But the two by chance happen to find that they have a lot in common, and after spending an evening together, Rick and Baltramau soul bond with each other. This causes the wizard to return and punish the dragon for his sluttiness, sentencing the dragon to hang to death. But Rick, Morty, and Summer infiltrate the fantasy realm and, after a setback involving Rick's tech not working, manage to liberate Baltermau and team up with the exiled slut dragons to overthrow the wizard. In a B-plot unrelated to anybody else, Jerry finds a talking cat who insists on taking him to Florida because nobody asks questions there. The cat abandons Jerry to hang out with cool strangers on a yacht, only to get kicked out and the two return home. In the end, Rick finally decides to find out why the cat can talk, which disgusts him enough that he's forced to erase Jerry's memory of the event. The reason the cat is able to talk is never shown to us, as it's something that the audience should have been able to enjoy the episode without knowing. Through the entire plotline, the cat is constantly trying to get Jerry to stop worrying and stop asking questions. The idea that the two can have as much fun as they want to if they simply don't think too hard about the way the world functions. Morty is taught a similar lesson in this episode. He wants a D&D style adventure with a real dragon, and in the dragon realm he has the idea of using a spellbook to guide him through the land. But Rick Science ends up giving him and Summer powers that allow the two of them to simply fight their way through. The way Rick fights his way through every plotline as of late. Morty is the one who gets left behind for trying too hard to engage with the world, and in the end, he's the one most let down by the revelation of how dragon culture actually operates. Rick and Jerry are mentally scarred by the revelation of why the cat can talk, the narrative punishing them for their curiosity when they could have simply left the question unanswered. In the end, this is another episode that epitomizes the show's theme of not worrying too much about small details and letting yourself live in the moment, getting swifty, if you will. In this instance, rather than not sweating the details of plot lines, the writers are encouraging viewers not to worry too hard about the exact scientific explanations behind every single piece of tech that Rick uses, or every universe they visit. Let the jokes land, and move on. Listen to the exposition and don't think too hard beyond that. If you do, you're only going to damage your own enjoyment of the show. Rick and Morty was designed as some mindless fun that can get a few good laughs and anybody making a multi-hour video essay on the subject is wasting their lives. So maybe this is an episode about how we shouldn't think too hard about the stories if we want to enjoy them, and maybe that conclusion is something that can only be derived from thinking too hard about the stories to the point that they become less enjoyable. Ultimately, this is an episode of Rick and Morty about dragon orgies and talking cats, so maybe any sort of analytical reading of the narrative is already looking too far into it. Rattlestar Rick Lactica while Rick is changing a space tire, Morty gets bit by a space snake and kills it with a hubcap. He feels guilty when he learns that the snake was the first snake astronaut of a snake planet, and so he buys a snake at a pet store in order to prevent 19 billion snakes from losing hope that their astronaut never made it home. But the snake planet is able to deduce that the snake from Earth is an alien and unites under the knowledge that there is intelligent life out there and that they need to eliminate it. But because the survival of this intelligent life force is what caused the snake society to thrive in the first place, Morty becomes an icon in snake history, and hundreds of snakes are sent back in time to assassinate slash save his life. Rick remedies the situation by discovering snake time travel and giving it to the snake society in Snake 1980 with the hopes that they'll use it in a much stupider way that attracts the attention of the time police, who go back to prevent snakes from developing tools in the first place. Meanwhile, Jerry becomes slightly lighter than air, and has shoes that are slightly heavier than air, as Rick and Beth believe that he can't put up the Christmas lights without killing himself. He ends up failing to wear his shoes properly and floats away, refusing help from Rick until he can make it back home on his own. The showrunners of Rick and Morty have stated multiple times before that they despise time travel stories. The mere existence of time travel trivializes almost any issue that can occur in the best cases and makes them needlessly convoluted in the worst. 
This is represented by a box in Rick's garage labeled Time Travel Stuff that is physically, as well as metaphorically, shelved, showing the team's commitment to not using time travel as a means of deus ex machina. In this episode, the box gets tipped over in the fight against the snakes, representing the fact that this commitment has been temporarily broken. The episode as a whole serves as a justification for why time travel stories are never told in Rick and Morty, despite it being a staple of the sci-fi genre. It takes almost no prodding for the story to go from Morty putting a snake in a spacesuit to thousands of snakes portaling into Snake Hitler's mans. The absurdity of the whole plot is removed from the temporal existence, literally for being too weird as the time police intervene. I'm not sure which episode is stupid, this one or the slut dragons from before. I'm not saying stupid in a denigrating way. I'm confident that the showrunners were actively seeking to make these plots as dumb as possible in order to either prove a point or make a joke on the eventual absurdity of it all. Both plots are prompted by Morty trying to do something on his own despite Rick's arguments against it. Morty, by this point, has grown into less of a moral opposite of Rick and more of an ideological opposite. Rick doesn't care about anybody or anything, but Morty frets that he may have caused a snake planet to lose hope. This episode is a finale of Season 4's first part. The season was split in half in order to hit a deadline and keep audiences engaged, as the time between seasons was getting excessively long. Not so long as some of Adult Swim's other programming, The Venture Brothers comes to mind, but still long enough that it was necessary to release something to tie audiences over, which is something that comes as a benefit to a show that seems to write storylines in response to the community surrounding it. The Never Ending Morty Rick and Morty are aboard a story train, a train that tells meta-narratives about Rick and Morty, a literal narrative device not unlike Morty's mind blowers or interdimensional cable. In order to get to the engine room, they need to create a three-act structure with a twist in the plan, made literal by putting a timer on Morty's spacesuit that causes it to give out after a certain amount of time. Eventually, they reach the conductor, who begins extracting potential stories out of them in order to maximize marketability and appeal. But Rick and Morty are saved by the power of Christ, because they understand that nobody wants to watch shows that draw heavily from the Bible. But their victory is short-lived, as it's revealed that the entire episode took place inside of a toy train that Morty bought for Rick at the Citadel. The story train is the once-per-season anthology episode that Rick and Morty tends to do. This time, the point is made to have a literal interpretation of the various real-world executive decisions that go into writing an episode of Rick and Morty, or anything for that matter. There are only so many stories that can realistically be told about the existing cast without breaking continuity, and by extension, the audience's investment in the world, or subtracting the initial appeal. And these stories have to be carefully weighed against one another. For example, a story that panders to what the audience wants will invariably be popular, but hurts the show's future by being too satisfying, like when a couple in a long-running sitcom finally hook up, removing much of the suspense from their relationship. Or if a story drags on for too long, it eventually consumes itself by trying to one-up its previous adventures, typically referred to as jumping the shark. This episode makes literal the devices used to tell stories and uses them to tell a tale about tales, like Morty's non-sequitur story being told that it needs to pass the Bechdel test in order to be considered legitimate. By the way, the Bechdel test was never meant as an actual metric with which to measure representation. It was instead posited as a laughably low bar for media to stumble over to prove how underrepresented women are in fiction. But at the end of the episode, Rick reveals that the real reason the story exists is because it's a product that you spend money on. The entire purpose of Rick and Morty isn't to tell a story about nihilism or optimism or to deconstruct science fiction tropes. It's not an analysis of pop media and the audience's role in shaping culture. It's a vehicle that increases the value of ad space. It sells commercials, like all media does. Even this very video is just something that exists to sell ad space. In fact, here's an ad right now. How, how is that ad? I hope you weren't using an ad blocker or skipping around a bunch. That, that'd ruin the bit. But back on topic, the story train's actual shape is a reference to Dan Harmon's story circle, itself adapted from the hero's journey, an archetype of storytelling design that encompasses everything from Star Wars to the epic of Gilgamesh. In the end, this episode is a story about stories, but then again, isn't every episode of Rick and Morty the same? Pro-Mortius Rick and Morty discover themselves on an alien planet with face parasites called Glorzos controlling their actions, liberated only because of happenstance. 
They infiltrate the planet in order to find their ship and return home, only to learn that Morty's Glorzo was actually somewhat powerful in their society, and that that society had built itself impressively large very recently. They blast their way out, doing a Pearl Harbor for good measure, and then make it home where the duo learns that they forgot to bring back Summer. So they return to the planet to rescue her, only to learn that she is being revered as a god. Summer fills Rick and Morty in on the fact that the Glorzo Society consisted of living for half an hour, exploding an egg, and dying. Summer revolutionized their culture by convincing them not to lay an egg and die, and to live their life to the fullest instead. But when Summer tries to leave, they attack the Smith family, and are eventually killed when Rick weaponizes Morty's terrible harmonica playing. Promortius experiments with non-linear storytelling via the twist structure, going back to refill gaps in a story after a crucial detail is revealed. It's a bit convoluted, but after the story train and the time-traveling snakes, it's actually very refreshing to see the writers return to a much more typical sci-fi story. What happens to a society made by a species that reaches maturity after two minutes if they're allowed to grow old? If they reach the levels of advancement humans would achieve if we didn't grow old and die at a certain point. Rick and Morty assume that they're a malicious species because they take control of other species' bodies in order to reproduce, when the reality is that they're simply trying to convince members of their species on other planets not to lay an egg and die. This gives the episodes earlier, Guild Free Massacre, a new dark layer of irony, as they were actually just blowing up a population center that was trying to prevent death. Because of this dark reframing of the episode's events, we get to see what happens to a planet after Rick and Morty leave, and this serves as a meta-narrative on why Rick and Morty don't revisit old planets after they've had an adventure there. We know by now that Rick ruins the people he spends time around, so having him spend time on a planet would inevitably have the same result. This also mirrors the style of writing that the showrunners prefer. Exploring a new concept or planet or society will give us a new story and new dimension for the characters to explore. Revisiting old plots comes across as pandering and limits how much the writers can do with their stories. It also hurts rewatchability for any reruns on syndication. If a new viewer happens to catch a Citadel of Rick's episode, they'll be more likely to be lost and less likely to go back to the beginning and watch everything. Whereas if they watch an episode that takes a more straightforward approach to storytelling, they're more likely to want to learn more about the characters and as a result, watch more. This episode gives us a glimpse into a different dynamic between the main cast members. Summer is now the one in charge, with Morty being valued for his skill set and Rick being the odd man out, complaining about everything that's going on. And of course, for this dynamic to exist means that, yes, Summer is basically a main character now. The Vat of Acid Episode Rick and Morty meet a group of alien mobsters to exchange some crystals, with Rick's contingency plan for failure being a vat of fake acid that the duo can pretend to dissolve in, should they need to fake their own deaths. Morty is not impressed by this idea, and complains that Rick is losing his edge, and that they should try one of Morty's ideas. So, Rick caves and creates a save point device that allows Morty to save his place in time so he can repeat his mistakes. While using the device, he manages to live a great life, falling in love and overcoming adversity, only for Jerry to accidentally reset all of his progress and Morty to end up traumatized by a bunch of events that never happened. So Morty tries to return the device to Rick, saying that he's learned his lesson about the value of consequence. But, Rick reveals that the device didn't actually reset time, but caused him to jump to an alternate universe, disintegrating his old self. Thousands of Mortys died a painful death, and the only way to undo it is to merge all of the universes that Morty abandoned in the process, which means that he has to face the consequences of all the people in the multiverses that he's wronged. Or, he can jump into a fake vat of acid that Rick prepared to fake his own death. Rick is annoyed that Morty insulted his idea, and so he comes up with an elaborate scheme to force Morty to use the idea on his own. The takeaway from Morty's adventure seems to be that consequences are good, and living without consequence causes us to live for nothing. Rick has always been the type of character who evades repercussions for his actions, though. No matter what kind of trouble he gets other people into, Rick always tries to escape their responsibility, and force others to deal with whatever he's caused. Occasionally he'll make up for his actions, but only because somebody he cares for is hurt by them, and he tries to care for as few people as possible to prevent this from happening often. And so when Morty declares that he's going to avoid living consequence-free, Rick doesn't actually want him to take this lesson away, and offers him a chance to run away from it all. The Vat of Acid doesn't just represent Rick's intelligence, but his whole way of life. Interestingly, this episode has no B-plot, at least not in the typical way for a Rick and Morty to do. Instead, the B-plot of this episode is structured as a change in what the A-plot is about. You expect that this is an episode about Morty receiving a save point device after an argument with Rick, and his trauma from the experience with the unnamed woman is the episode's conclusion and moral. Because of this, the twist that we were still in the A-plot all along is something that truly lets this episode live up to its name, the Vat of Acid episode.
There's also somewhat of a fake-out, at least I thought as much, in that you would see the episode title and setup and assume this was a bottle episode. Rick and Morty stay in the vat for the entire runtime, listening to some alien talk. Since it wasn't that, the fact that they returned to the vat of acid at the end really should not have come as a surprise. This episode won an Emmy for Outstanding Animated Program. It beat out Bojack's Horseman, The View from Halfway Down, and I'm still annoyed by it. Don't get me wrong, it's a great episode, and the airplane scene alone makes it deserving of the nomination. But to beat out Bojack's last word and what death means, I'm still bitter. And I'm saying this as a fan of both shows. Childric of Mort Rick interrupts a family camping trip in order to respond to a call from a planet he impregnated named Gaia. She gives birth to a newly evolved race, which Rick has no interest in raising himself until Beth demands that he stick around rather than abandoning them like he did to her. So Rick and Beth create a sort of volcanic Dyson sphere designed to sort and condition the various Ricklets into career paths that will bring the species into maturity, or type 1 status. But this is complicated when the race's actual father, a Zeus named Reggie, shows up and demands to see his children. Reggie gives god powers to Jerry in order to leave a troop of the Ricklets deemed as unproductives to battle against the city Rick and Beth constructed while Rick and Reggie duke it out in space. The conflict ends when Summer and Morty get high and play video games respectively and accidentally crash an alien ship they found into the back of Reggie's head. Rick's abandonment of Beth is explicitly brought up as the reason that she's able to guilt trip him into staying to take care of the race of Ricklets. But his parenting methods here are reflective of the childhood Beth could have had, one where as much of her future can be automated as possible. Rick automatically sorts Ricklets into their designated roles, largely by random. It's a cold and uncaring sort of way to rear a child, and one we've seen him use before. In Rick Mencing the Stone, we see Rick creates a series of robotic replicas to keep Beth occupied, while he takes his grandkids on an adventure that she would not have approved of. This cold and distant parenting style is something that produces a large number of unproductives, which wind up mad and vindictive towards their supposed caretakers. And this is a group that Jerry fits well into. Of course, Rick hates Jerry, he views Jerry as unproductive and useless, and yet Jerry is the only person Beth has ever managed to fall in love with. For a super genius who can solve any problem and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a literal deity, you would expect that Rick would be able to solve the unproductive's issue. If he's so smart, why can't he find them a purpose like he's done so many times? Maybe this is where the root of his hatred for Jerry comes from. Rick has invented a helmet that can give a dog super intelligence, so why can't he make Jerry smarter, if only so he can tolerate the guy's presence? Maybe he resents the unproductive Jerry because Jerry has something that no level of intelligence was ever able to give to him, a happy relationship. At least, a happier relationship than whatever Rick has ever managed. In the end, the Ricklets are doomed by Rick's inability to maintain a healthy relationship, picking fights with their capital F father that result in the destruction of most life on the planet. It's not too different from Rick imploding the Smith family by his arrival, and before that connection can be made on the ship ride home, Rick lays into Beth and Jerry's parenting style, in order to stop them from potentially getting high and mighty. After spending the entire episode trying to lift Beth's self-esteem up, he ends it in failure, represented by Rick tearing down others like he always does. Star Mort, Rick Turn of the Jerry, J Jerry, Jerry. Beth's possible clone returns from her space adventures after finding out that there's an explosive device in her neck that would have killed her if she returned to Earth. She tries to learn from Rick whether she's a clone or the real Beth, but Rick dodges the question until the Second Galactic Federation invades Earth while looking for her. So the Smith family is forced to, quote, do a Star Wars in order to rescue their moms and defeat the Federation. Again. Rick has a gratuitous fight scene against Bird Person, now Phoenix Person, and everybody gets an arc that culminates in a happy ending. Almost everybody. Rick asks Beth if she and Beth want to find out who the real one is, but they turn him down stating that they don't really care as they're both real enough. Summer and Morty don't care either, because they're just happy to have two moms, and so Rick tries to learn for himself, only to recover the memory and discover that even he left it up to chance. Rick is a character who has defined himself by two worldviews that are constantly challenged by the world. One, that nothing and nobody matters, so you should only live for yourself. The other is that only he matters, because he can do everything. If nothing matters, then surely he doesn't matter either, so there's no reason to have such a big ego. But often when he finds himself making a truly important decision, such as whether he wants his daughter to stay with him or go out and live her life, he's unsure of where his priorities lie, as he's not used to caring enough about another person that his actions will affect them. In the end, Rick cannot make a decision for another person, he can only act selfishly, and so he continues his trend by cloning his daughter and then refusing to learn who the clone is. 
Season finales tend to be grand set piece episodes in Rick and Morty, and this episode only continues that trend begrudgingly. Rick is visibly annoyed that they're doing a Star Wars, and he considers it gratuitous. The Smith family is more willing to go along with it, but even then, they're more excited about having a character arc where they grow closer together than they are excited about destroying the bug aliens a second time. Maybe the only reason Rick is upset about the obligatory finale group hug is the fact that every time a character undergoes a story arc in this show, they usually conclude that arc by realizing that he's toxic and difficult to love. Even Rick himself has a similar conclusion by the episode's end, discovering that he wiped his own memory in an important moment of his daughter's life because he himself wasn't ready to take even the slightest bit of responsibility. Rick knew that if he told Beth to stay and be a mom, that he would have to spend more time around her to support the family that she values. If he encourages her to go out and follow in his footsteps, then he has to take the responsibility when she inevitably becomes exactly like him. Beth's domestic life is a great unknown to Rick, and he's not eager to discover what that might mean. If Beth is able to succeed where he failed, that comes with the caveat that he failed in the first place, so Rick's ego is the biggest obstacle to his own happiness, and it pains him to see when others aren't making the same mistakes. Season 4 Wrap Up Season 4 marks a return to form for the show, less eager to have longer, ongoing plot threads about action and more willing to use the sci-fi of the setting to explore the characters. But rather than completely returning to Season 1's emotional detachment, Season 4 is willing to build upon the lessons learned from previous years of the show's run. When a sci-fi gadget is introduced, we're less likely to see the implications of the gadget on the setting as a whole, and more likely to learn about a character through their use of it. These sorts of character explorations were some of the best episodes of the season's past, and it's good to see that the showrunners have found the show's stride and managed to follow that. But this doesn't come without cost. Season 3 was by far the most self-indulgent season of Rick and Morty, nearly obsessed with its own world and the creativity of the writing staff. But the more nuanced character dives that are apparently less appealing to audiences, that or the much less cynical idea that people were simply driven away from the show by the brief pop culture explosion of Szechuan sauce, but when is complaining about a show on the internet ever actually stopped people from watching it? And season 4 reflected a dip in the show's popularity to the tune of nearly 1 million weekly viewers. The show would never again reach the same level of viewership as it did during season 3's peak, but I feel as though time will be more favorable to the type of content that we get going forwards. Content that invites more critical thinking from its audience, as it refuses to adapt to mass appeal, but grow from mass criticism itself. Mort Dinner Rick Andre Morty crash lands Rick's ship in the ocean at the end of an adventure, breaking a treaty Rick had with Mr. Nimbus, King of the Ocean. So Rick has to impress Nimbus over a dinner in order to resign the contract and make things right. And he tasked Morty with aging the wine. Morty is given access to a quote, Narnia portal where time passes more quickly so that the wine can age faster, but he's distracted by the fact that he's finally managed to date with his longtime crush, Jessica, and ends up accidentally angering the inhabitants on the other side of the portal, who respond by creating an entire civilization dedicated to hunting him down for revenge. Meanwhile, things aren't going well for Rick as Mr. Nimbus comments on how Rick has lost much of his edge lately. But when Morty needs help after the portal people kidnap him and Jessica, Rick tries to rescue them, only for the now hyper-advanced race to use his own tech against him. In the end, Mr. Nimbus saves Rick and they make peace, until Summer returns from her story to track down the source of the Ocean King's power, and the contract is broken again. This is the last appearance of Jessica and the series as of writing this script. She's persisted through the series as a one-sided love interest for Morty, a sort of tertiary goal to surviving and appeasing Rick, but one that in this episode is shown to be worth more than either of those. Basically, if the writers need a reason for Morty to act stupid, Jessica is usually that reason. But now that she's out of the show, this could signal the start of Morty beginning to mature as an individual and as a character. It could, doesn't mean that it will. But Jessica, or Ethan, or Kiara, or whoever the romantic plot device's name is being out of the show, means that the writers are now required to have the character motivated by love towards an existing character, unless that love is meant to represent a fling of sorts. Later in this season, we'll see Morty start a relationship with Planetina, and Rick with Daphne. In order for those romances to have any sort of lasting impact, it helps to write old fixations out of the show. Mr. Nimbus follows in the long-standing tradition of off-screen canonical events defining present-day, present-time plots. Introduce a character who has some sort of history with another character, as if they've been a constant source of emotional strife for some time, despite being new to the audience. The episode Total Recall plays with this idea in the memory parasite concept, though that episode concerned itself more with recurring characters than temporary one-offs. 
Ironically enough, Mr. Pooby Butthole from that episode managed to become the exact thing he was ostensibly meant to make fun of, and only due to the layers of subversion that set up his introduction did the writers get away with this. Mr. Nimbus manages to strike a happy middle ground by being closely related to Rick. The only reason it doesn't catch us off guard when a new character is added to Rick's backstory is because he's so secretive about it in the first place. The first episode of Season 5 already puts us into a strong starting point, and one that sets up the fifth season as a whole. This is a season with significantly less attachment to ongoing plots than any other season except maybe Season 1, and this episode puts us right into that concept, with Rick even shouting at Mr. Nimbus for trying to establish canon. It's up to the next nine episodes to show us how this will pay off, for better or for worse. Morty Plicity Rick receives a notification that his decoy family has been terminated by squid people, so he tells the family to pack up. As they do so, it's revealed that Rick set up a decoy family in case somebody tries to track him down and he needs to buy a moment of time to get away. But then that Rick is killed too, and another Rick takes his place, explaining the point of the episode once again. He's killed, and soon we see a cascading effect, as more and more Smith families kill each other due to believing that all the others are decoys and preparing to kill everyone else. As the episode goes on, more and more decoy families are introduced, explained, and then killed off, as the decoys were making decoys of their own, and not all of them turned out great. The episode then turns into a bloodbath, as various ricks from around the globe hunt each other down until there are no more survivors. In the end, the real Smith family returns from an off-screen outer space adventure. Off-screen is perhaps the only place in the show that is truly able to preserve a character's role in the story. As long as a character doesn't appear during a narrative, we can be sure that nothing major will happen to them. This comes across as obvious, but it's still something that's taken into consideration in this episode. As I said in the previous episode's review, this season has very little to do with canon so far, and in order to preserve that, we quite literally have the entire family absent from this episode. Because off-screen is the only place where a character is safe from canon, at least any canon that can't be explained away in an establishing shot. And even then, only in the case of writing that's not lazy, which fortunately Rick and Morty's writing never is. I also want to count this as the seasonal improv episode, in the vein of the story train, Morty's mind blowers, or interdimensional cable. It sets itself up for that sort of conceit. Here are various different Smith families with slightly different weird quirks. Make up something, and once you run out of ideas, get them killed by squids. But the episode doesn't take that direction. Instead, it's just a series of misdirects designed to get you to stop thinking so hard about following the story, and more about enjoying the story. It's a very Rick and Morty episode, in that it runs with the sci-fi concept, in this case, decoy families, about as far as it can go, running with developments that are as spontaneous as they are adapted to. I like the idea that Rick's inventions and adventures have a life of their own when he's not actively tinkering with them. We've seen before that he's liable to simply destroy an invention that doesn't go his way, or that runs out of potential for entertainment. And we've seen that his ignored and unchecked inventions tend to go awry in ways that are well beyond his control or intention. It's not something that comes up incredibly often, so when it does appear, it's a nice treat. Though it's better that we have the idea introduced posthumously after he's lost interest in the concept. Revisiting old plot lines and devices can make the show come across as pandering at best and creatively bankrupt at worst. A Rick Convenient Mort Rick and Summer go on a blowout adventure to three planetary apocalypses in order to have some fun, with the rules being that they never get attached. But Rick ends up in a relationship with an alien named Daphne, who Summer claims is only tagging along so she doesn't die in her planet's apocalypse. She ends up being right, as during a tantrum, Summer prevents the third apocalypse from happening, forcing everybody on the planet to have to go to work the next day, and forcing Rick to realize that he's being a jerk. Morty falls in love with a being made out of four elements, a la Captain Planet, and the two get into a committed relationship. Cut short when Morty realizes she's an environmental extremist, and he has to break up with her due to not agreeing with her methods. Rick has the potential to solve so many issues with the world with barely any effort, and yet he rarely chooses to do so. In this episode, we can see an interpretation of why. Planetina wants to save the planet from pollution, but her isolation as a tool of propaganda and capitalism, combined with these urges, cause her to lash out violently and produce a large amount of collateral damage. And all of it is ultimately for nothing. Lasting societal change has to come at a societal level, not just a few people being killed off. Otherwise, nobody learns a thing and the whole process begins again, just with different faces in charge. We saw this at the end of Look Who's Purging Now, as well as basically any plot involving recursion. 
This is the same reason why Rick feuds so much with the president, but never simply tries to replace him. In the end, there are still enough people who view him as a threat that there will be a new enemy to fill the same role as the last one. This is one of the first episodes where Beth being the bad guy to one of Morty's ideas ends up with her being in the right in a way that feels real. Before, she would tell off Morty for having a party, but ultimately it turns out alright because Rick gaslights everybody into compliance afterwards. But here, when Beth tells Morty that he shouldn't fall for a fling, it comes across less as the type of nagging that shows about adolescent teenagers tend to denigrate, but it comes across as actual mothering. Maybe this is just her reflecting her own mistakes in winding up with Jerry onto her kids, or maybe there's some lesson that she's learned from another past experience. But Beth is a great mother in this episode, something that she could not have learned from Rick. In the end, Morty separates from Planetina because of her violence towards people he views as innocent. But Morty has done significantly worse, and for far less of a just cause. How many hundreds did he kill on the Purge planet or the Apocalypse Earth, all because he had repressed rage? Is it Morty being a hypocrite and not recognizing his own faults in others, or is this episode about Morty seeing the worst parts of himself in another person and not wanting to wind up with an enabler? Ultimately, we don't get a real answer to this question, but not for a lack of a satisfying answer. This is one of the most truly heartfelt moments of Season 5, but unfortunately it goes downhill for a while after this point. Rick Dependent Spray Morty uses a horse breeding mount to pleasure himself around the same time that Rick is experimenting with horse semen to create a bioweapon. He ends up producing a massive amount of giant mutant sperm that begin to terrorize the country. So Rick and Morty are mobilized to put a stop to them at the same time that Summer has an idea to enlarge one of her eggs as bait for what the US government is assuming is space sperm. When Morty finally admits the truth at breeding mount point, there's now a race to stop the sperm from fertilizing and creating a giant mutant incest baby. We're back to the Season 1 style sci-fi parodies, not just in subject matter, but tone as well. This time the story borrows plot beats from various action flicks, down to the title, but rather than copying any particular story elements, this episode mostly focuses on tone, while letting the monster sperm idea remain as the core original idea. So the only real thing that's borrowed from pop culture here is the show's insistence on side-eyeing the camera and trying to absolve themselves of the responsibility if things go off the rail, which they do. So the worst aspects of Season 1's insecurity make a return, alongside the worst parts of Season 3's hubris, in assuming that they can carry any sort of sci-fi idea, as long as they're silly about it. This trend continues for the next four episodes, inclusive, which coincides with the stretch of the four lowest rated episodes of Rick and Morty, according to viewer ratings. And just when Morty has started to make some positive character development, we see him regress back to the mindless horniness of Season 1 episodes like Rick Potion No. 9 or Raising a Zorp Azorp. We're thinking with his pants causes catastrophic disaster. The first few times this plot beat came up, it was humorous, a teenager abusing sci-fi tech and getting an embarrassing comeuppance. This time, though, it comes across as both character aggression and the plot's going to retread ground we've already seen covered. Maybe there's some cultural context I wasn't able to find when researching this episode, like the show got called Crude by a critic and the showrunners lashed out at it to say, you want crude? Well, here's crude. Or maybe somebody praised the show too hard for being more mature than everything else on the air, and so the writers decided they were being boxed into an idea and wanted out. Or maybe someone was trying to get fired, I don't know. A Morty Can Grick Feedy Jerry and Rick go to a guy's night, where Rick shows off Jerry's cringeworthy habits to a group of Hellspawn who enjoy anything painful. Jerry is having a genuine good time, even after Beth joins in on the revelry, until he overhears two of the guests making fun of how he acts. When Jerry decides to stop being the butt of everyone's jokes, the Hellspawn kidnap Jerry, and Beth and Rick are forced to follow them to rescue him. Rick creates a device that will turn cringe into cringe, and he fights his way out of hell with his family in tow. In the end, he announces that the next time, he's just going to make a clone of Jerry instead of saving him from damnation. Meanwhile, Morty and Summer try to impress a new student by taking Rick's car for a joyride, only for the car to blackmail them and have fun on her own. But when things don't go as planned, she accepts her role as a tool of war, and blows up as a society to return things to normal. Cringe humor is a form of humor derived from another person's misplaced confidence, the ability to laugh at somebody who misreads a social situation or adamantly puts them out there in a misguided way. To laugh at another person's suffering is schadenfreude, to laugh at their embarrassment is cringe. It's not a surprise that Rick and Morty would eventually create an episode about cringe humor, considering its relationship to both sides of the spectrum. The show's community represents both the perpetrators and victims of the cringe singularity, 
Rick and Morty fans have defined themselves as looking down on other pieces of media, as well as being looked down upon by other fandoms. The whole world got a laugh when people declared Pickle Rick to be the pinnacle of entertainment. In this episode, we get a few words from the creators on this paratextual relationship. Cringe cannot exist in a vacuum, it has to be observed, and since cringe is typically a result of extremely misplaced confidence, it's possible to laugh at somebody while laughing with them, typically at a person who thinks you are laughing with them. Rick then plays the role of both fans and detractors of Rick and Morty. To laugh at somebody who's just having a good time can be seen negatively if the reason you're denigrating them in the first place is a result of your own issues with self-esteem. Sometimes, calling somebody cringe because they're enjoying themselves is an announcement to the world that you yourself cannot enjoy anything at risk of showing any level of vulnerability. And really, nothing is more cringe than pretending you're better than somebody else. At least the guys making a fool of themselves in a McDonald's parking lot were doing so surrounded by hundreds of other fans. The people sitting alone in their bedrooms acting superior are the real losers. If Rick had simply left Jerry alone, or even stuck up for the guy when others were first making fun of him, then Jerry wouldn't have been considered a loser. One guy doing bad karaoke by himself is cringeworthy, but a guy doing bad karaoke while his friend cheers him on is having a genuinely good time. I guess what I'm trying to say is that Rick and Morty is a really good show if you don't have someone in your ear telling you it's not. Rick and Morty's Thanksploitation Spectacular Rick and Morty blow up the Constitution of the United States by mistake, and so Rick has to once again disguise himself as a turkey in order to receive a presidential pardon. But the president is planning for this, and diverts resources to loading the van transporting the turkeys with marines who have been turned into turkeys. But when the president himself transforms into a turkey to stop them, there's a mix-up and the military re-uploads the president's DNA to the wrong turkey, a turkey who vows to convert every turkey into a super soldier to take over the country. Rick, Morty, and the President, whose name is just The President, team up to take down the super soldier turkeys, recruiting the help of not one, but two races of ancient aliens. The Thanksploitation Spectacular follows the very Season 2 trend of taking a sci-fi concept to its illogical extreme. We've seen an invasion of the country by turkey kind, who are implied to have invaded the world before and need to be taken down a notch again. It's actually a bit strange to see a plot like this one and compare it to something early in the series. In Season 1, we saw a giant man dressed as Santa blown up, and people were put into a panic. In Season 2, giant heads invaded the sky, and people began to worship them. But by the time Season 5 rolls around, the layman of the setting of Rick and Morty seem to be much more conditioned to accept the absurd as normal. Sure, people run in panic, but it's not like they aren't used to seeing this sort of thing already. Is it Rick who's numbed the world to this sort of sci-fi nonsense, or is the world adapting to the position of the audience? This episode is effectively a retreading of the ground covered by the Rick, Churi, and Morty did. We see the advanced tech that the US government has developed in response to Rick's inventions, though here it's less about trying to combat the sci-fi BS of the world, and more about an implication that things have always been this way. Rick and Morty used to be about a weird guy doing weird stuff in our world, but now it's about a weird setting where sci-fi things happen like this all the time. Rick is a lot less special when the rest of the world's caught up to him, or in this place, implied to have outpaced Rick's tech long ago. I've said before that Rick and Morty manages to stay fresh by refusing to revisit old ideas and rehash existing concepts. This episode comes across as very pandering and uninspired, despite the idea of a mutant turkey invasion, purely because we're revisiting characters and ideas that have been in the past. Watching the US military create its own portal gun is interesting, but only the first time we see it. Now it's played out and comes across as though the writers were out of ideas. A shame because this is a very visually impressive episode that's just wasted on a rehash plot. Gotron Jerry Sis Rick Vangelion Rick finds the last fifth of a giant assembling robot he's been keeping for a while and decides to give each member of the Smith family one so they can fight giant mutant space bugs. Then he decides that fighting all of the space bugs in one dimension isn't enough, so he contacts the Ricks from other dimensions so he can have 25 robots instead of 5. Naturally, this spirals out of control as the amount of micromanaging increases exponentially, literally, until his family becomes isolated and he's forced to outsource labor to other genres, accidentally reaching out to the original robot's owners. In the end, Morty has to convince the rest of the family to work together to save Rick from his own hubris by bringing back the giant incest baby from episode 504. Rick and Morty as a show has an obsession with recursion. It pops up everywhere, from Me Seeks and Destroy, to The Ricks Must Be Crazy, to Rattlestar Rick Lactica. Basically, if the sci-fi concept introduced in the episode has the opportunity to recur upon itself, it inevitably will. This has been done so consistently that the show itself can start to play with the idea of recursion as a plot point. 
Morty begins to see it coming, and he tries to warn his family about it, but they're too caught up in the plot to predict how it will end. As expected, Rick ends up putting the family in danger because he doesn't listen to anybody who tries to tell him no. Rick's obsession with science for the sake of science takes a very Season 1 approach here, where Morty's level-headed reaction to his devices serves as a means of tempering his ideas and dragging them down to reality. But just as a recursion is overplayed to the point of parody, Morty's counters to the idea are overplayed enough as well that people begin to ignore his advice, and that itself can be a parody-worthy plot element. For the first few seasons of Rick and Morty, Morty has desired the attention of Rick. In fact, most people do because of how difficult to please he is. But Morty has, by now, earned that attention so many times, and so thoroughly, that the appeal has all but dried up for him. And because Morty no longer cares about chasing it, Rick has turned to the validation from the next DS man in line, Summer. Summer is eager to please Rick as she's always been left out, which, combined with how difficult Rick is to please, makes her twice as much of a sycophant as Morty ever was. And twice as much of a yes-man means twice as much yes to be said to. So Rick's concepts can exponentially spiral out of control, leading to a disaster of potentially much greater proportions that requires a much greater effort to combat. But thankfully, the absurdity of the Gotron plotline was never able to top the absurdity of the giant mutant incest baby, and everything turns out okay in the end. This episode borrows heavily from anime concepts, much in the same way that the show has previously borrowed heavily from science fiction. But, like the previous interpretations, only borrows from the cultural idea of these concepts, rather than pulling directly from the source itself. As a result, Rick and Morty doesn't parody anime, it parodies the idea of anime that most Western audience members have. So it's not a proper representation of the tropes to be disassembled. Ba basically what I'm saying with this part is that you should go watch Samurai Champloo. Ricternal Friendshine of the Spotless Mort Rick attempts to resurrect Bird Person while the Smith family's on vacation, but Bird Person's mind refuses to be resurrected. So Rick enters his friend's memories in order to find the current Bird Person and bring him out to safety by convincing him to live. While searching through memories together, Rick teams up with a younger version of himself, or at least a version of how Bird Person remembers his younger self, and the two fight their way through various historical battles before ultimately having to relive the day Rick was forced to admit that he cares about another person. In the end, Rick learns that Bird Person and Tammy have a daughter, a daughter raised in detention due to having a wanted man as a father and deceased government employee for a mother. And Bird Person decides to live for her sake, although he scorns Rick's invitations due to the latter not wanting to share that information until it was personally relevant to him. Rick Dependence Day through Rick Vangelion marked a large decline in the average per episode ratings of Rick and Morty, one that was concluded by the release of this episode. The edgy humor, seemingly subversive for the sake of being subversive, did not resonate well with fans and detractors alike, and the fact that the streak was ended by possibly the most serialized episode we've received yet indicates a potential direction for the show, and certainly one for the remainder of the season. It's clear that by this point Rick and Morty has evolved well beyond the era of episodic standalone gag plots, and into the age where audiences are both primed and prepared for episodes to tie into the larger ongoing narrative of the show. A show can get away with being more comedic than emotional in its early seasons, much more than it can do so in later incarnations. We've grown too attached to the characters to watch them continuously stagnate between the weight of meaningless, silly plots. Past Rick exists in this episode as an audience surrogate. He's a character who's there purely to be surprised by the twists of the plot, as we learn more and more of Rick's past. It's a role that's typically reserved for Morty or Summer, somebody that needs to have things explained to them so the audience can also learn what's going on. If it were Rick and Bird Person alone inside BP's thoughts, there'd be no pause for effect or time to let the facts sink in without some sort of distracting B-plot. But this episode remains focused purely on Rick's history, and is stronger for it. It also has a creative way of showing character relationships. As we are inside a Bird Person's mind, everything created there is a figment of BP's perception. He remembers Tammy as being nice, the only reason the memory of her doesn't resort to violence against Rick. He also remembers Rick as being a more moral and optimistic person. It's for this reason that the past Rick manifested by BP's subconscious is wary of becoming his future self. BP knows that Rick is miserable, and therefore is also aware that past Rick would be disappointed to learn what he will become. And of course, this means that BP too is upset with how far his friend has fallen since his glory days. Many characters from Rick's story have been defined through their relationships to the scientist, much in the same way that the Smith family had once been defined by who they were relative to Rick. As the show developed, so did the characters, and this was only possible by the cast stepping out from beneath Rick's shadow. This episode serves as Bird Person's turn to evolve from Rick's friend into a character in his own right. Forgetting Sarek Mortschall 
Morty uses up most of Rick's portal fluid while fixing all of Rick's past abandoned projects, and tries to cover it up, accidentally spilling some on his hand in the process. He ends up with the portal to a guy named Nick's leg, and Nick encourages Morty to cut ties with Rick, as their relationship is clearly toxic. But Nick turns out to be just as manipulative a partner as Rick was, and so Morty ends up cutting ties with him by removing the hand completely. Meanwhile, Rick is showing off his new replacement partner, two crows, literally a pair of birds that he trains to assist him. But Rick ends up learning a lot from the crows, and after a few adventures, realizes that they make for better partners because they force him to acknowledge his past toxicity. In the end, Rick and Morty part ways for good. Except, you know, it's the second to last episode of the season, and it's syndicated television. There's no way that the partnership would truly end there, and sure enough, by the next episode, everything's back to normal. Sorry for the spoiler for anybody who's watching this video without having to see the show, but like, I don't know why you'd be concerned about spoilers in that case. It's like if I started to wrap up this video and told you that this was the end, but you could clearly see another 45 minutes of runtime left. It's one of the issues with major television syndication that comes with the medium. Viewers know that nothing big will change outside of season premieres and finales. Plots need to be wrapped up in multiples of 22 minutes. And the three-act structure best fits two ad breaks, so that's what you're going to get. Interestingly though, this is actually something that gets played within the next episode regarding the central finite curve, but since that's then and this is now, I'll talk about it more there. Rick and Morty's relationship is a toxic one. And toxicity is something that's almost never recognized when it's happening. Even after both parties recognize that they're unhealthy for each other, Morty for enabling Rick, Rick for abusing Morty, both characters still have some small part of them that craves a return to normalcy, even though normalcy in this situation is not something worth returning to. But since Morty had just experienced a second toxic relationship with Nick, he's much more likely to think that that sort of behavior is normal, and so he's the one who's more desperate to reconnect with his grandfather. But since Rick was the one who found a healthy relationship following the breakup, he's the one who has more of a means to compare what relationships can and should look like. In the end, Rick learns what happiness can look like from two crows because he was able to start over with them. Despite laughing at the idea of a crow-based society at first, he soon accepts it and understands his role as an equal in the relationship. The relationship between Rick and Morty was not equal, and therefore ended up being hurtful to both of them. To find happiness with another means that they need you as much as you need them, but not so much neediness that you can't operate independently of each other, the way Beth and Jerry's relationship has turned out. Rick Marai Jack Rick learns that the two crows from the previous episode were also using him as a rebound and breaks up with him, crawling back to an equally desperate Morty who used an aging serum in an attempt to guilt trip Rick. The two try to undo Morty's aging by returning to the Citadel, and they're roped up into a canon story, where the Morty president offers them dinner only to scan Rick's brain and learn the schematics for the Citadel itself. He reveals a plan to escape the central finite curve, which is essentially a wall between the versions of the multiverse where Rick is the smartest man in the universe and the versions where he's not. We also learn that the Citadel was really created as a sort of peace treaty against Rick C-137, who had been indiscriminately killing alternate versions of himself in an attempt to get revenge for the deaths of his original family. In the end, Evil Morty succeeds in getting away, and Rick and Morty drift into space in the ruins of the Citadel. Rick and Morty is a show that has always maintained an aura of mystery, due to most of the more esoteric activities being things that only Rick understands, and Rick is a very unreliable source of info. We first hear of the Citadel as being a place where Rick can hide from the outside world, but the reality is that the Citadel is a place where Rick can hide from himself. The one place Rick goes to for isolation is actually a place for him to avoid learning more about who he is. The sense of irony comes from the fact that people don't really develop when they're left to their own devices. We can only grow and learn about ourselves from our relationships with others. Who Rick is is something that he can only learn by opening up. If left alone, he'll simply continue to run away. We've seen him open up to Bird Person and get hurt in a flashback, we've seen him isolate himself through his revenge story, and now the Citadel exists as a monument to his resistance to sociality. But this episode gives us a feel-good ending in the fact that, after everything, Rick has finally managed to accept the fact that he can't keep running away. Represented twice, first, by the Citadel being physically destroyed, the symbol of his isolation and ego being destroyed due to the actions of somebody who was tired of being hurt by him. Second, in plain text by Mr. Poopy Butthole, who looks directly at the camera and tells the audience to be closer to the people in their lives, instead of obsessing over a TV show. This is the second time a Citadel episode has obfuscated the subject matter by naming itself something else, the episode title and intro being a fake-out in the same way that the Rick Lantis mix-up did. 
Citadel episodes always have major consequences for the show as a whole, and this one's no exception. We see Rick's backstory told during a montage, something that's been shrouded in mystery for so long, as Rick is not usually the kind of guy to open up about anything. The fact that we're finally learning more about the guy is a sign that he's a changed person, finally ready to face the world without his shield of cynicism. Season 5 Wrap Up Season 5 has embodied both the best and worst that the show has to offer. It had a long run of crude, pubescent humor one might find in an early internet flash, but it also had much deeper character introspection. Plot lines that showed off just how strong the characters are, and how well written the people in those plots have become. It's a marvel, then, to look back at the show's history and see just how much has changed and how dramatically too. Because the early seasons of Rick and Morty, the conception of the show, embodied the same kind of shock humor that the lower-rated episodes of this season also embodied. People don't like it now, but they were such great fans of it back then. So this begs the question, what changed about the audience that would make this evolution occur? Has the audience matured, or is it that the show's grown up? How much of our expectations have risen over the last five seasons, that a return to form would actually be met with resentment? And was this the intention of the showrunners all along? It's not an easy balancing act that Season 6 will have to accomplish in order to meet the demands of the various sides of the Rick and Morty fandom, but not an act that the showrunners haven't managed to do already. Solarix Following in the aftermath of the Season 5 finale, Rick and Morty are traveling through space on the destroyed remains of the Citadel. They're nearing death when Space Pet, that's her name now, saves them. The first thing Rick tries to do upon returning home is try to reset portal travel, but he ends up resetting portal travelers. This means that everybody is returned to their original dimension. Morty ends up in the Cronenberg dimension, where he meets his original father. Rick is returned to the dimension where his family was killed, revealing that in one of his stupors, he's been resetting the same day again and again in a sort of poetic self-flagellation and Jerry is taken back to a Season 2 dimension after he was swapped during the Jerry Bury back in Season 2. Rick tries to hunt down the original Rick in order to get his final vengeance, but Morty talks him out of it and the two return home, where they come across the Beth pair in the midst of an argument over the morality of abandoning the family. In the end, they have to find a new universe once again after Jerry ends up Mr. Frundling the universe by mistake. Another season premiere, another soft continuity reset. This one comes with the caveat that the writers are much more self-aware of that fact, and as a result, the characters know this too. But rather than the typical detached cynicism of past seasons, the Smith family of season 6 is accepting of the fact in a found family sort of way. They acknowledge that it could be simple to say that nothing matters because they all had to hop dimensions and that they're still infinite copies of them and so on, but they choose to accept that whatever dimension and family they wind up with is the accepted one. Nothing matters, nobody matters, so why bother spending all of your time moping when instead you get free agency to make whatever meaning you want to out of the universe? The Cronenberg Dimensions Jerry has managed to move past the tragedy of losing everything, and has accepted that everything is worse now. He's adapted to the new reality, and is therefore a good teacher for Morty and the lesson of learning from past missteps. But ultimately Morty doesn't take this lesson fully to heart. Jerry has completely moved past his old life, but isn't exactly shown to be happy, because he's too focused on the present. If you lose your whole family and simply try to ignore that fact, then it's as though they never really meant that much to you in the first place. Rick, on the other hand, is shown to have failed to let go of the past at one point. He's created an entire hellscape that's designed to continuously torture himself and anybody else caught in his fear of influence. But the Rick we have today is one who's matured since the time that he created an AI ghost wife to haunt him. He still clings on to the past, after all, that's his motivation to make a better future. And so the main takeaway from this episode is not to cling to the past, not to run from it completely, but to find a healthy middle ground. A place where you can grow from experiences, both old and new. Rick, a mort well lived. Morty's mind gets trapped inside of the Roy Arcade game from Season 2's Morty Night Run during a power outage and is fractured into every single NPC in the game. So Rick enters as Roy and begins to use his influence to convince every single NPC that they are not a real person but one five billionth of a 14 year old boy. He's about ready to get the Mortys onto the edge of the in-game playable area, which will force a restart and let him out, when a few of the holdout Mortys realize that they're living better, more fulfilling lives inside the game than outside. After a holy war, and then an even holier war, Rick finally gets the begrudging acceptance of the last of the Mortys to leave, mostly because they need to help Summer with her diehard. 
Summer's Die Hard is her reenacting the events of the movie, with the catch that she hasn't actually seen Die Hard, but the gangsters she's fighting don't know that. Rick and Morty has been a show that references sci-fi and pop culture since its inception, which one would expect to lead to a bit of difficulty for those in the fandom who miss out on the references, but this ends up not being the case. Because while Rick and Morty has ample references to pop media, it never actually parodies something outright, instead focusing on a parody of the popular understanding of the word. This is pointed out during the episode. Every species eventually evolves to create some sort of die-hard on their own. Its cultural impact is something inherent to civilization, rather than just the team that originally created it, which is why it's gained popularity at all. Of course, this sort of unconscious collective mythos is typically reserved for works like Cinderella, or The Hero's Journey, or many fairy tales for kids. The fact that we're seeing it done through the lens of a 1980s action film is just a bit of that classic Rick and Morty humor that we've grown so used to. The A-plot of this episode is interesting in that rather than parodying some aspect of pop culture, it parodies an idea conceived within Rick and Morty in the first place. We get to revisit Roy, a life well-lived, but rather than retreading previously explored plot beats, we instead get a retelling of the character beats. The story of Morty dislikes being looked down upon by Rick and demands more respect is something that we've seen since Season 1's Me Seeks and Destroy. This time, however, it's done with the framing of Rick trying to overcome this plot through time dilation so that he might engage with something a bit more action-packed, like a diehard. In the end, this episode almost comes across as a parody of parodies. So self-aware in just how easy it is to overplay a story beat that you revisit that they've looped back around to creating an original idea out of a plot being overdone, only to loop around a third time and finish off the plot of Die Hard beat for beat. It subverts expectations so hard that you can get a better twist out of playing it straight, the last thing anybody would ever expect Rick and Morty to do. Bethic Twinstinct Beth and Space Beth spend time with the Smith family during Thanksgiving, only for the two Beths to realize how much they have in common and eventually fall in love. Morty and Summer keep accidentally walking in on their moms being intimate, causing them to play realistic video games as a means of distraction, so they can avoid thinking about what's going on in their periphery. Everybody finds out, except for Jerry, as the family is convinced he'll kill himself if he realizes his wife slash wives is slash are being unfaithful. But when Jerry finds out, he turns into a pill bug instead, something Rick installed, and refuses to leave his pill bug state until he's emotionally ready to. Beth and Beth argue over whether to encourage him to come out of his shell, before eventually concluding that they should simply have their memories wiped to forget about each other. But then Jerry emerges and tells them that it wasn't about the infidelity, but the fact that they never so much as asked him if it was okay, and in a second twist, reveals that he really is, much to the collective horror of the rest of the Smiths. The fact that there are two Beths running around with two different lives means that we get to explore both sides of the fence in this grass is greener metaphor that I'm not going to finish. Their mutual love represents the fact that no matter what changes about their circumstances, Beth will still retain enough of herself that she's content with either outcome, as nothing fundamentally changes about who she is just because she's been to space. But the disagreements then are all aspects of her life that she's still torn over, as these are the things that could change due to living another life. The major source of conflict being Jerry. While Space Beth resents that she's tied down by him, Earth Beth also resents that fact, and Earth Beth resents that she's defined by any part of her life by her relationship to Jerry just as much as Space Beth does. And of course, the one person around whom this entire conflict stems is Jerry himself, and he's not happy being the source of conflict to people who he still very much needs emotionally. It's for this reason that he ends up giving not just his blessing, but total approval to the Beth self cessed storyline. He loves Beth, and he loves Beth, so both of them being happy must also make him happy. In the end, a little bit of communication was all that it took for this love triangle to resolve with everybody getting a happy ending, and it was Jerry, the least Rick-exposed character of the cast, to be the one to make this conclusion. Rick, Summer, and Morty all spend this episode trying to ignore the implications of what's going on around them, or at the very least to avoid having to directly expose themselves to what is essentially a masturbatory act by their parents. Though ultimately, this episode isn't about any of them, a positive sign for the health of the character stories as a whole when the characters who started out as side stories can carry an episode without the main trio. Night Family Rick buys a somnambulator, a device which takes over his unconscious body while he's asleep and uses it to make his body do all the things he's too lazy to do while awake. The rest of the Smith family finds out about this and they all demand in on the action, only for the family's cells at night, or night family, to begin to resent the day family for being too lazy to rinse their dishes, among other small bits of laziness. Eventually, the night family takes over, 
removing all the furniture from the house and extending the range of the somnambulator so they can be in full control, forcing the Day family to work for them instead of the other way around. Eventually, through the help of Day Jerry's relationship to Night Jerry, the Day family is able to escape, and they attempt to flee outside the range of the device, but they fail and Rick is overpowered, forced to either accept the task of rinsing his own dishes or have the Night family take over full time. After a few months of full-time Knight family partying, they realize that it was the Day family's job to keep the bills paid and the counting done, so they wake themselves up, allowing the Day family to deal with the consequences of the bender. Knight family is controlled by Knight Summer, the rest of the Knight family members responding to her commands. So why Summer of all people? What is it about Summer's subconscious that makes her the one that the rest of the family answers to? I think it has to do with her rebelliousness streak. The kind of thing that every 17-year-old has, taken to a logical extreme in the circumstances of the Smith family's one-sided relationship with Rick. The Knight family recognizes that Rick is the one who controls the tech that gives him sentience, and since Summer is the least influenced by Rick, Morty being the one most traumatized by his adventures, Beth living in his shadow for most of her adult life, and Jerry being the one to have had his status taken by the man, it's Summer who resists Rick's influence the most, as she's the only one with the ability to continue to do so. This is probably the first totally standalone episode of Rick and Morty's sixth season so far. Standalone in this sense means that you could drop this episode's plot into any of the earlier seasons and it would still read. The midpoint of every season is typically the part where the writers have gotten the new shiny mentality out of their system. That is, the urge to create a story that they couldn't have written before due to the characters not being in the right place to do so. But once we get a few episodes that are unique to the current season, we can make a return to form in standalone plots. And it comes across as a relief too. If the whole season were a bunch of these, the audience would grow wary of the constant lack of buildup that the show has. But too many of the serialized stories grows exhausting after a while. Having a mix of the two gives time for each writing style to breathe without the series having too much of a sense of whiplash from concept to concept. It's a nice inversion to see that, at the end of the episode, when Dayrick is held hostage by the Knight family and forced to accept rinsing the dishes, Rather than showing off some newfound respect or learning a lesson on compromise, he simply spurns the offer and lets the Knight family fully take over. It's exactly something that his character would do and almost calls into question why we expected him to break character in the first place just because the episode is ending. Final Death Smithation after receiving a fortune cookie that says he will have sex with his own mother, Jerry begins to live in fear over the concept of fate and begs Rick to do something about it. Rick is skeptical of the validity of this fortune cookie, but soon learns that Jerry's probability field is skewed highly towards actually doing it. So they investigate the source of the fortune cookies together and learn that there's a massive conspiracy to control the world through manipulations of fate. All done by Janet Padro Chunt, who has captured a sick Lockarian who has mutated with the ability to create blank fortunes, fortunes that are guaranteed to come true. As it turns out, the man responsible for caring for the Lockarian has been creating absurd fortunes as a cry for help, that somebody might investigate and free him and the creature who he assumes will accept him as a lover. Rick tries to take over the facility, but Janet attempts to stop him by forcing Jerry's fortune to come true, as before that happens, the person the fortune is attached to is effectively a mortal. But Rick manages to override Jerry's fortune, complete Janet's fortune, and eventually bring everything back to normal through manipulations of fate. Season 6 has a trend of giving each family member at least one episode dedicated to Rick being a better person to them specifically. Beth the Twin Stinct is an episode where Beth gets over her parasocial relationship with Rick. Night Family is an episode where Summer gets to have the spotlight for most of the second act. And Final Desmethation gives us a Rick and Jerry adventure. It starts out as most Jerry ventures do. Rick is only going along out of curiosity, and it ends similarly as well. Rick eventually does some nice thing for Jerry that he didn't need to do. In the end, Rick and Jerry have a small falling out right after it seems like their relationship is on somewhat better terms. The concept of being able to manipulate fate comes across as very fantasy in this storyline, rather than something sci-fi like the series is used to covering. In the end, there turns out to be a much more scientific explanation for what's going on, but even then, this is a very tenuous connection, as well as one that doesn't really need to be made. By this point in the series, science and magic are effectively interchangeable. The future episode, A Rick and King Borders Mort, even plays with this idea further, lending credence to the idea that it's not an especially important point. Rick and Morty plays with so many high concept ideas that by this point practically anything goes, so long as the story told is still engaging. Jurixic Mort Dinosaurs return to Earth, revealing that they only left because they had achieved technological perfection and then allowed the primates to live in luxury. 
their MO being to create a perfect balance on a planet and then to leave it in good hands. But humanity starts to get bored without any conflict to rile them up, except for Jerry, who writes a self-help book about how to do nothing. After several weeks of agonizing vacation, the president turns to Rick to investigate and eliminate the dinos, and he learns that every planet the dinosaurs have ever visited were eventually wiped out by a race of barely sentient rocks who simply smashed into the perfect planet, causing as much damage as possible. Eventually, the dinosaurs realize that there is no non-violent solution to the meteor problem, and they leave Earth to its own destructive devices, heading to Mars instead, where they hope to bait the meteor away from the planet. Mad that the dinos are getting one last virtue signal in before leaving, Rick baits them into blowing up the meteor to save his life. And so they repair the dimensional rift left in the season 5 finale as a final middle finger to the scientist. The dimensional rift, I feel, was a poorly defined threat that the writers themselves weren't exactly sure what to do with. It existed as the leftovers from Evil Morty's scheme at the end of Season 6, and it allowed Rick Prime to escape into the central finite curve, but beyond that it only really existed as a sort of physical reminder, a narrative symbol more than anything else. It harkens back to Rick's dead wife AI from the episode Solarix, and thus doesn't really serve an actual purpose that hasn't already been deconstructed and played with. Because it was a poorly defined threat, this meant that any plot that involved closing the rift would have to either recontextualize the rift, or come across as somewhat meaningless in its significance. The rift no longer needs to exist, but it still does, so how then do the writers put the final dots on the I's and crosses on the T's for this plot? The answer is not to have Rick close it himself, but for another character to do it for him as a representation of his own moral failings. The dinosaurs in this episode represent everything Rick should have been but isn't. He's the smartest man in the universe, on the same tech level as the dinosaurs, but they use their knowledge for good, while Rick uses his selfishly. It's hard for him to even comprehend why someone would use their elevated position to help raise others, and he spends the whole episode trying to figure out their true motivation. But the reality is that they've been very forthright with their intentions from the beginning. The fact that a race of meteors has been destroying all their life's work is a tragedy greater than any exploding citadel or dead family, and yet, Rick treats it like a joke. If he loses the morality race, he can at least win the nihilism race. But the dinos get the last laugh, because while Rick is celebrating the destruction of the dinosaur's way of life, both metaphorically and physically, they ultimately get the moral one up against him when they close the rift, itself a representation of Rick's inability to move beyond its past, but a limitation that the dinos do not share, and thus are able to repair for him. They may not have been able to change Rick's mind, but they can at least force him to start changing it himself. Full Meta Jack Rick Rick and Morty go on an adventure about going on an adventure, tracking down a series of meta characters defined by cliches in order to meet Retcon, with the ability to retcon the entire episode, ensuring that the whole thing wasn't canon. But he instead teleports them outside the third wall, where they perform the next step of the story circle and become rescued by an old man with soup, Joseph Campbell, who theorized the version of the hero's journey from which Dan Harmon's story circle is adapted. Meanwhile, Story Lord makes a return and uses the power of Christ to escape reality and threaten his writer into making him more motivated, which culminates in him sapping the motivation from the world until Morty can channel Campbell's spirit to convince him that if you have to force a narrative, it's usually not one worth telling. So typically when I write a script for a video, I start with the outline. I do this because I'm aware that the hardest part of writing any sort of long-form content is retaining that initial wave of motivation that made me want to write it in the first place. I could easily crank out like three or four thousand words a day for maybe a week, but it's a lot easier to take that initial wave of motivation and use it to organize instead. So my video scripts tend to look a bit more like Excel spreadsheets at first, and then I simply have to fill in each block bit by bit until the entire thing's finished. This is why each episode review takes roughly three minutes to do, because that's how long it takes for me to read one page. Additionally, this is why I do the recap, rant, review, wrap-up style of scripting. Remember that from the intro? Each page is four paragraphs long, and yeah, you can sort of guess what those four paragraphs look like. The actual process for making a video usually starts with me watching the episode first and taking screen caps every time there's a scene change. I, I try to imagine that I'm doing like a reverse storyboard. Then I write the episode script itself shortly after while the story's still in my head. I can do about three or four of these a day, and I can record myself reading maybe six with my reading voice before my throat gets too dry and I take a break. Honestly, the hardest part of recording is trying to find a time where there's no background noise. My roommates have dogs and I live in a neighborhood without an HOA. That has its own benefits, but quiet neighbors aren't one of them. Anyway, I finish the video by editing the audio first. I keep the script open in another window while I do this. 
Most of the audio editing just consists of me taking out things like breathing and swallowing, or if, if like I stutter, I try to edit those out. I'm not going to do the audio editing stuff for this section, that way you can hear exactly what my videos would sound like if I didn't do any of that. Honestly, I think my videos would be fine if I didn't. Uh, like, I'm just getting in my head about how annoying, how annoying my breathing sounds. Anyway, the music is picked out pretty randomly from stuff I think won't get a copyright strike. That's also the reason that I do the screen caps instead of edited videos, by the way. Video strikes actually mess messed up the uh, BoJack Horseman video I made. I had to start over like 60% of the way through the editing process because of those. Anyway, I edit the videos in parts, usually about 40 minutes each, or like basically one season per part, and then I put all the parts together and make that the finished project. I do this because I have like 8 gigabytes of RAM. I need to upgrade, but you know how hard word prices can be. I really don't know if this bit is funnier if I acknowledge it or if I leave it as it is. I mean, surely you put together the episode's themes and figured out why I'm doing this right now. Really, I think I can only get away with this because we're like, uh, what, like three hours into the video by now, so... Analyze Piss Rick tries to figure out why 90s goofball villains keep attacking him and, during a therapy session, gets the suggestion to simply ignore them. When a villain named Pissmaster attacks the Smith family, Rick puts this into action and it works. But Jerry ends up aggravated and he attacks the villain instead, leading to a victory and some viral internet fame. Soon, Jerry is given an orb of power, a reward for having a pure heart, and Rick begrudgingly helps him by giving him a suit powered by the orb. Jerry goes on to become a celebrated hero, while Rick soon gets bored with the loss of the constant comic relief storylines. So Rick investigates Pissmaster and learns that the man committed suicide as a result of the world laughing at him for his defeat at the hands of Jerry. Rick ends up adopting the mantle of Pissmaster, saving lives and clearing the man's name, before rigging a bomb to make it look as though he's heroically sacrificing himself, letting the man die a heroic death instead of a pathetic one. When Jerry refuses to let go of his petty dislike for the guy, he tries to stop the sacrifice, losing his orb in the process. In the end, the Smith family, quote, discovers that Pissmaster was Rick all along, and he simply wanted to boost Jerry's self-confidence. But Rick can't keep the actual secret, and the family actually ends the episode by arguing with each other over the fact that Rick couldn't keep a secret and that Jerry killed a guy. I wonder how much of Rick's character assassination at the end of this episode was self-aware. Disguising himself as Pissmaster is probably the most selfless act he's ever performed, up there with sacrificing himself for Morty at the end of a Rickle at Time War, turning himself into the Galactic Federation in the Wedding Squanchers. But both of those actions were to help a family member. The fact that he was willing to risk so much to give Pissmaster a happy ending, despite him being a stranger, shows a new side of Rick. A side where he really does want to use his abilities and knowledge for the betterment of others rather than just himself. It's a sign that he's a changed man, but that fact isn't something that he necessarily wants. Rick is a man who programmed an AI of his wife to torment him, specifically so he wouldn't forget her. So if he changes, even for the better, doesn't that mean that he's moved on from the memory? And is that disrespectful to do? Rather than dealing with these thoughts and feelings, Rick discards them. It's an act of effort to run away once more. He gives up on keeping a secret that helps somebody else, on letting others accept that he's a changed person. He can't stand the idea that other people's stories and plights have moved him emotionally, not after dedicating so much of his life to the idea that he's this emotionless stoic, a man of science, not feelings. Because if other people can change who he is, Rick believes that others can overpower him in that way. To grow is to admit failure. But the Smith family doesn't see it that way. They see it the way anybody else would. They all get the information and realize that their grandfather threw away the one truly good act he's ever done, the one thing that humanized him and showed off that he was improving. Rick has once again failed where others have exceeded, and that eats away at him. A Rick in King Mortar's Mort While waiting in line for a pop-up, Morty is offered a sword. Rick tells him not to accept, but Morty ignores the advice and takes it anyway. He's then brought on board to an order of knights who defend the sun and all that orbit it. But when he's told that he'll need to castrate himself in order to fully join, he rejects the offer. Yet the Sun King refuses to let him leave unless Morty can best him in single combat, which he does because Rick gives him a smart sword. In the end, Morty becomes Sun King, but this is annoying and he gives up the honor by teaching the Knights of the Sun that their religion is false. Of course, with no Sun Knights, the solar system falls into chaos, and Morty finally accepts that he'll have to reorganize the Knights, which means that he has to castrate himself to prove his commitment to the tradition. In the end, Rick and Morty vat of acid themselves out of the mess and the tradition is done away with. Remember when Morty wanted a dragon? The episode where he desperately demanded that Rick give him a medieval fantasy creature to play around with? 
This episode's conceit is very similar to that one, in that Morty is tempted by some high fantasy adventure concept, but soon learns that it's not all that it's cracked up to be. The difference between this plot and that one is that in this plot, Morty is never especially into the idea of becoming a knight, or even a king, and only sort of begrudgingly goes along with it because he feels like he has nothing better to do that day. Morty drops this idea much faster, and I think that's emblematic of the fact that Rick is beginning to influence Morty more and more. Season 1, Morty would have been all over this idea. Season 4, Morty would take a bit of time before losing interest, and Season 6, Morty gets over the idea almost immediately, following along more out of curiosity than nothing else. The whole castration deal was, frankly, just the last straw on an already desiccated camel's back. And then there's one more layer of irony to the entire situation. The fact that Rick complains later that Morty shouldn't have taken the sword at all, because Rick explicitly told him not to do that. And yet, that's the main reason Morty took the sword in the first place. He didn't even want it, not at first. But then Rick said not to take it, and so, in an act of defiance, Morty takes the sword and the whole adventure goes off the rails. Once again, Season 1 Morty would have done what Rick told him to do and ignored it altogether. But Season 6 Morty has grown so similar to Rick that he's even begun to do the Rickest thing you can possibly do. The opposite of what an authority figure asks you. The similarities between the two aren't all negative, though. Morty disproves a religion using science and logic, completely killing off interest in the idea to the knights, despite the fact that they're literally correct. They have noticeable knightly powers, they're immune to the sun, and yet a few notes on a board and a quick demonstration is all it takes to end their belief in those abilities. It's not as though either one would have worked on its own. The other planet's leaders all own the staff at various points, despite knowing how it should work, and yet they're more obsessed with what the staff represents that they're willing to overlook the fact that it's just a symbol of power, and not power in and of itself. It takes belief to keep those systems in place more than anything else. Rictional Mort Poons, Rickmas Mortcation Morty gets a lightsaber for Christmas, but accidentally drops it perfectly vertically down to the core of the Earth. While chasing it, he learns that Rick has been in the basement since about halfway through the last episode, tracking down Rick Prime while a robot programmed to be 22% nicer to Morty did all of the family engagements he was putting off. Morty is upset and recruits the help of the President to retrieve the lightsaber by commandeering Rick's tech. Eventually, Rick ends up helping, but Morty refuses to go on another duo adventure after Rick assumes that he'll want to, still hurt from Rick's earlier betrayal. But then Morty is betrayed again by the President, who just wanted a lightsaber for himself. The President also drops the lightsaber straight down, and so the plot is repeated, just with robot Rick adventuring with Morty to go into space and punish the President for trying to pin the second lightsaber incident on the Smith family. In the end, Rick saves the day and Morty says that he wants Rick to stop trying to do serialized adventures without him. Rick accepts, and the season ends with Rick saying that the two of them are going to track down Rick Prime together, no matter how dark the series has to get. At some point during the previous episode, Rick substitutes himself for a robot programmed to be nicer to his family while he can spend the rest of the season following a personal character arc. The twist is revealed during this episode and Morty acts shocked, but the rest of the audience should really understand by this point. We've seen Rick make strides towards self-improvement during the show's run so many times, and just as often, we see him regress to who he was before. Rick's obsession with revenge has forced him to damage relationships with his family, himself, and anybody else he can get close to. His nihilistic detachment is something explained as something that, rather than being indicative of his own morality, is actually a defense mechanism. Something to keep others away so that others don't get dragged into his life. So to create a sentient robot to occupy his family while he falls further and further down the rabbit hole of seeking Rick Prime makes perfect sense for his character. He cares enough about those closest to him not to want them to wind up the same way that he has, and the best way to prevent that is to stop them from getting close to the real him altogether. But in this episode's ending, Morty demands that Rick stop putting up so many walls and accept him as a partner again, and Rick relents. But this acceptance comes with a warning, the same warning we've seen so many times before. If you hunt Rick Prime, you become a worse person. The drive to cling onto the feelings of the past will stop you from growing, and the more you hunt monsters, the more you become one. Rick is prepared to let Morty get into that lifestyle, to pass on the traumas of himself to his grandson, although this may not be a dark finale to the full story. I've stated before that the best way to prevent emotional pain is to share those feelings. Rick is bitter and cynical because he keeps all his pain to himself. If he would only let himself be vulnerable now again, he'd have a much better mentality towards life as he'd have the support of those around him. Rick's story is a tale of a man tortured by pain and unwilling to inflict it onto others. And yet perhaps those others aren't quite so opposed to letting the man open up as he believes that they are. 
Season 6 Wrap Up Season 6 is the most recent season as of uploading this video. It doesn't set itself up as a finale in any circumstance, and it directly sets up the following season. Of course, if there's anything that we know about Rick and Morty, it's that promises are made to be broken. Rick and Morty are just as likely to spend the whole season tracking Rick Prime in a series of high-concept sci-fi thriller stories as they are to spend several episodes hunting down Szechuan sauce. While I don't doubt that Rick Prime will come back as a recurring villain later, I can only hope that the showrunners don't lean too heavily into the serialized aspects of the show. Rick and Morty shines in its flexibility. It can have crazy sci-fi stories with robots and aliens, and then turn around and tell a down-to-earth story about family. It can set itself up as a highly advanced story about technology, and then turn around and make an episode about knights and wizards without feeling as though they're tone deaf to their own style. Rick and Morty is a show that's able to do so much with their concept, and the writers know this and take full advantage of that flexibility. Rick and Morty can do anything it wants to do, and the only challenge on the horizon is keeping it that way. Outro Maybe it's a little bit strange to do a retrospective on a show that's still actively airing. We're getting more seasons on the horizon, and the story is still far from over. But since Rick and Morty is a show that has such a close paratextual relationship with its audience, I feel as though discourse of this kind can never be out of place or out of time. There's a lot to say about the show, and despite this video's length, I still don't feel as though I said everything that I could have. But I'm not going to drag this video on unnecessarily. This is a good ending point, so I'll try and take the exit while it's still there. The last thing I want to do with this video essay is to include some sort of conclusion section, where I summarize the series as a whole and give a succinct single theory about its place in the world, or one single thought to wrap up everything. Rick and Morty is a show that can do a lot. Rick and Morty is a show that does a lot. Rick and Morty is a show that says a lot. And while it's practically a running joke online to act as though the fandom regularly looks too deep into its themes and characters, and that it's just stupid surface level fun, I feel as though anti-intellectualism of that kind is one of the most hurtful things we as a society can normalize. I mean, yeah, sometimes the curtains are blue because the author is making a metaphor for his depression, but sometimes they're just blue for no reason. But at the very least, we should be able to tell the difference between the two, instead of taking the latter interpretation for granted. Is Wubba Lubba Dub Dub a commentary on the philosophy of nihilism, or is this just a stupid thing that Rick says sometimes? The most important takeaway from this video, at least the takeaway I hope that you're getting, isn't one of definite answers, but the ability and knowledge to be able to draw and then support your own conclusion, no matter what that might be. Okay, the actual conclusion of the video is to watch the Venture Brothers. <sighs> Rick and Morty Bushland B Bush World Adventure. This this is the Australian one. This is the this is one from Australia. Rick is going to Bendigo, but fucks up the cog. Morty uh, he does he gets a little grub on his cog. The they pranked him. Rick Rick kicks. I, I think Morty kicks this dude over. He turns into a car. The dude that he kicks over. They go to Bendigo for like a a cube. I think I think I, I think this this is the episode where Rick has a gun. Uh, they gave Rick a gun in the episode. Um, this is all canon. The episode's canon. So so everything makes sense. Uh,